Hello, my name is Leah Fiore Tracy, and welcome to Take Me to Eternity. Matthew seven fifteen to 23 Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Today we have a compelling episode diving deep into the nuances of theological discourse that are taking place inside the Christian community. As I'm sure at least some of you know, American Gospel has released a four-hour roundtable discussion that took place between Sam Storms, Michael Brown, Jim Osmond, and Justin Peters. If you haven't subscribed to AGTV, I highly recommend that you do. It's well worth it. I thought it would be fun and insightful to review that discussion with people who might have a thing or two to say about it. This is the second of the two reviews that I've done. Let's just jump in. I'm going to introduce my guest today. As you can see, I have two lovely guests. First, we have Dawn Hill, the host of The Love Sick Scribe, a YouTube channel and blog where she seeks to point women back to Jesus Christ and the truth of his word. Then we have Richard Moore who is the host of Church of Preneurs podcast. He's also a missionary in Germany, a church planner, evangelist, youth minister, father, all of the things, a man of many hats. So Don and Richard both have a heart for the lost, as well as seeking to expose the NAR and helping people come out of deception. So hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the discussion. How are you guys today? Doing well, Leah. Doing great, Leah. Thanks for having us. Looking forward to this. Yeah, it's going to be a a good discussion. Um, As you both know, we're talking about the four-hour roundtable with Jim Osman, Sam Storms, Michael Brown, and Justin Peters. Um, We will just jump right into the questions. There was a criteria set by Justin Peters for what a false teacher was right off the bat in this discussion. His standard was that they would not teach or behave in a way that contradicts Orthodox Christian beliefs. Storms added to that the denial of foundational truth without which a person cannot be saved. How do you think that addition added to the confusion of the rest of the conversation? Let's start with Don. Well, I think that it... um... Just as someone, I'm going to have a different take on it because of someone who is in this movement. So um, false teachers are going to say things that are true. So that's that's the thing is that when you're trying to identify a false teacher, for example, they're going to say things that even sound orthodox, but that doesn't mean that they are solid or sound people that we should listen to. Uh, even, uh, I mean, we can look at church's doctrinal statements on their website. Bethel's a really good example. They can pass what Justin Peters calls the doctrinal sniff test, but they don't practice what they say on paper or on, on, on screen. So just because someone professes something doesn't mean that they put it into practice. And so I think it blurs the lines. Um, and then it creates this way that who, how can you identify a false teacher and a false prophet? Um, Because if they're saying stuff that's solid and sound and sounds doctrinal, um, then we can't call them that. But we know that's not that's not the case. I mean, Richard and I both know this from looking at some of these individuals. Leah, you know, as well, that some of these people will claim things that are that are doctrinal and orthodox, but their practices do. They negate (laughs) what they state about that. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think about that, Richard? Yeah, I think I'm I'm right online there. Um, what I what I 
thought led to the confusion was is that um, it has to be either someone who has denied what it sounded like to me a denied a cardinal doctrine or was in sexual unrepentant sin am, am mm -hmm. i making am i understanding what they said correctly yeah um and and so that that's a challenge because it's and i wasn't sure from sam storms's perspective or michael brown's perspective did they say it had to be one or the other or both or it, it wasn't real clear to me and as the discussion went on it got even muddier in my opinion because what i gather from let's say at least sam storms's perspective was that you have to do one or the other deny a cardinal doctrine and, and that just that that just doesn't tell the pass the sniff test as you said don um the theological sniff test and he would have to if if you looked at the the whole discussion you would have to be able to sit down with that person and confirm that they actually hold that unorthodox position but i'd ask both you ladies what do you think do you think kenneth copeland would sit down with sam storms and actually say oh yeah 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 sure i believe in all those cardinal doctrines but doesn't a doesn't a wolf won't a wolf try to deceive people um when 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 pressed I mean, that's my experience. These people get pressed who don't actually hold to those uh, theological positions of antiquity. And they would actually get pressed into, you know, and 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 actually sort of wiggle out of it somehow. Um, I mean, uh, uh, false teachers are notoriously, they they clothe themselves as angels of, as, as apostles of light, as the scripture says. And they're going to try to appear orthodox in every way. And, and like you said, I'll just piggyback, just give you one example of the problems with Bethel. They would say, if you asked, actually Chris Valentin on the Rediscover Bethel podcast series said that they believe in inherency of scripture. Actually, he says the, the word inherent. Um, I, he means the word inerrant. If you go to the, so these guys, they really don't know any, they don't know those terms. They don't understand them. And so he just throws that word out, but he uses the wrong word inherent instead of inerrant, meaning no errors. Yeah. Our scriptures are inerrant. They have, uh, no, uh, no errors, not in the, not in the, in the teachings of the scriptures, not necessarily in the original manuscripts. So they believe or they give lip service to inerrancy, but then in their practice, they rely on visions, dreams, and revelations and extra biblical revelations as their modus operandi. I mean, I've watched several sermons lately, and either they twist scripture, they don't use scripture, and when they do, they quote it out of context, rip it out of its context. So a be, to be evangelical, you have to rely on the scriptures as your main form or your main uh, uh, source for epistemological truth. And they do not rely on it for their main epistemological truth. They rely on dreams, visions, manifestations, signs, wonders, and the like. They don't rely on scripture as their main source of truth from God, as God's word or God speaking to man. And so that's a one thing that puts them out of, like you said, Don, it puts them out of the theological uh, orthodox camp. And so the confusion was from the start, really interesting. You, you don't have to be a false teacher that, that to, to, or you don't have to be someone who steps outside of the orthodox, orthodox, um, pillars of, of, of like, like the, the Trinity, for instance, to be a false teacher, you can believe in the Trinity and still be a false teacher. You can believe in Christ's divinity and still be a false teacher. So it was confusing for sure. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> well, that was a point that was made when they were talking was that, um, people can lie about those things, but at what point do you believe that that person can actually be lying? You know, it was almost as if they said, yeah, somebody can lie about it, but if I ask them and they tell me what whatever, then I'm going to believe what they say. So there's no grounding for, you know, yeah, somebody can lie about it. They just, they don't have any, um, there's no concept of what that even means. And it seemed like 
you know, every time I see Brown get confronted with false teachers, his friends, stuff like that, he weaponizes the damning them to hell thing. It, every right. time he jumps to. I think we should leave to, that terminology on the side. It, it, it's ridiculous to do. We, we can't judge anybody's eternal soul. Yep. We have we have not the power, the authority. God does that. And, and so I, I I wish I wish Jim Osman and and uh uh Justin had come back at him and said, Hey, we're not trying to condemn anybody's eternal soul. I think we, they it, said that at one point. Okay, so they did say that. So I I, I wish I would have pressed harder, uh, because what we're doing is judging their public teaching. If mm -hmm. we just look at the person's public teaching. And their consistent public teaching in that, like, for instance, Kenneth Copeland, who has taught that we are little gods for years and years and years and years, um, then, then we just judge what he said publicly. And we don't ever say, this person's condemned to hell. I can't say that. I don't know what will happen to Kenneth Copeland in 20 years. He may yep. live to be to repent. And I would praise the Lord if he repents from his false teaching and his years and years of false teaching. And, that, and God would save him by his grace if he did. And so I wish we would just leave all that terminology to the side. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it, you have to look at the fact that, you know, they think that um, people in certain camps think that anybody who is discerning is automatically just trying to nitpick and they just want to condemn people to hell. And they don't realize that, I know at least for myself, I pray for these people, you know, I pray for Kenneth Copeland and Chris Velaton and Bill Johnson. I mean, they need the gospel, the real gospel, just as much as I do. You know, they, they're uh, sinners that need to repent just as much as I needed to repent and turn to the Lord. Like I, I need God's grace. They need God's grace. I pray for these people, but you can't just not call them out on things and allow them to, um, devour the flock you know you you have to warn people of the dangers that are ahead and be like look don't fall into that hole right there yeah so uh richard was talking about that with the criteria that storms and brown set they can't actually name a false teacher <laughs> what do you think about that i think that's ridiculous I think that's absolutely ridiculous. What 26 of 27 books of the New Testament warn us about false teachers and false prophets. The apostles were easily able to identify who a false teacher was and who a false prophet was. And it was based essentially before the canon was finished. It was based on what the Old Testament said. And, I, and again, as someone who was in this movement for almost 20 years of my life, I find it egregious and I find it ridiculous that... For one thing, people are told that we can't identify when Romans 16, mark and avoid. You cannot mark someone without identifying them. There's no way to mark somebody if you don't identify them. It's the most loving thing. I wish someone had done it for me years ago as a false prophet in this movement. But by God's grace, he got me out. And, in, and, I, and I trust in, in his sovereign timing that he did that for his own purposes. And um, I, I just find it, I find it ridiculous to say that we can't identify a false teacher when we're told in scripture um, over and over again to, to test these things. Paul warned Timothy in both of his epistles he sent to him about the ears were being tickled and to preach the word. And he, he laid out what these false teachers would look like. We have been given descriptions in scripture so we can identify them. And we are to identify them. John 6, 24 says that we are to judge with righteous judgment. And again, like what Richard said, I fully agree. We're not condemning people to hell. We're warning them what happens if they don't turn from their ways. Mm -hmm. And that's a loving thing to do. Mm -hmm. And what I believe uh, along with this is that what I would say is that when you tell people that you can't identify the false in here or you want to say this is a problem, as I'm sure we'll talk about at some point about Kevin Zadai and other people that they that, that they identified. When you tell people, well, you, how can you say that that's not true? How, you, you know, do you honestly know that's false? You're shutting down critical thinking. Mm -hmm. You're basically telling people, don't, don't say anything about these people 
because you don't know their heart. Well, scripture also tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We can judge their fruit. And many times their fruit is coming from their heart. What is done outwardly is what's in their heart, whether it's greed, whether it's lust, whether it's uh, lying, whether whatever it is, we can judge their fruit and call them to repentance. And so I, I just, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. And you're probably going to see me a little bit more passionate on here than I have been on some of these, but I've watched this round table a couple of times and I was, I was just flabbergasted. I thought, I mean, with all due respect, you have Dr. Sam Storms and Dr. Michael Brown sitting at a table. They are esteemed men in the charismatic movement. They're, they're known to be trusted individuals and yet they're willfully ignorant about what's going on. And then when someone does say something, well, you know, you're being judgmental. You don't know their heart. I've known this man all his life. Well, that did not age well. And, and, that, and that's sad and that's horrible. I'm, I don't relish saying that at all. It did not age well. There's nowhere in scripture that tells us we need to know these individuals on a personal level. And this is, this is not bode well for them in this conversation. We are told to judge fruit, to judge with righteous judgment. And that is based on what scripture says. And that is the final authority not their personal relationship that they had with them at all. Just to be clear real quick, that, that, that was me saying that I, I, I don't think they ever said in their discussion, we can't name a false teacher necessarily. I, I was saying, I was making the point of in our, in our uh, pre pre-show dialogue that I don't think these guys have it in them to ever name a false teacher. I don't think they can do it. I, I don't think they have the, moxie the gumption i don't know what whatever word you want to use to actually say that person is a false teacher that should be avoided would would you be shocked at some point if these guys both came out and said sam storms and michael brown said mike bickle is a false teacher that should be avoided do you think they could do that do you think they could bring themselves to do that i don't think they could no no and i and that's why i agree with your point is that I, I do think that that is um, that is a teaching that is underlying. They won't say it out loud, yeah. but there is a teaching in this movement that you don't identify people like that. If anything, what's identified as false are the people that are addressing the error and the issues. And then there's a diversion that takes place of, well, you know, they're just, they have a religious spirit and they're just shutting things down. And right. so they, would rather they, they name- won't. They would rather name people like us as false teachers yes. than, than yeah. people in their own camp, let's say. Um, so, so that's what I find that, again, sorry for the passion. <laughs> that's what I find ridiculous is that I agree with you. I don't think that they would because yeah. then they're going to be acknowledging that this person, we have to go back to scripture. Now, I will give them credit that they will try, they will attempt to make steps in that direction to say those things. But how many years is it going to be before somebody tries? I mean, Rick Joyner is already continuing to say, well, we, you know, this is a nothing burger. We need to restore Mike Bickle. Yeah. No. He's already on the Scripture restoration Scripture says path. he's yeah. disqualified. That doesn't yeah. mean he can't be restored to Christ. Right. That's not the same thing, but that's not what they mean in restoration. They mean back to public ministry where they can have full reign and do whatever they, that's what they mean. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, they can try to argue that. I've been in this movement. I know what they mean by that. And I've seen it personally happen in situations that that's what they mean when restoration, it's not about your egregious, horrible sin against God. It's about, let's get this person restored so they can be back on the public circuit. And that's ridiculous. You're right on the money. I think they would, you know, how many times has someone who has fallen into sexual sin in this movement, in this camp, been restored back to ministry in six to 10 months? Right. And, but that, but the Bible is clear in Timothy, Titus, and, and other places in Peter and Acts that a that a, a person who is a overseer, a shepherd of the flock, a, a elder, pastor, teacher, overseer, is disqualified from public ministry, from future ministry at all, if they have fallen into public sin. God help us, yep. right? I mean, the qualifications are not David for public ministry. The qualifications are not Samson for for public ministry in the church. The qualifications are found in Tim, Timothy and Titus. So yeah. Mike Bickle is, sorry, he will, he can be restored to the Lord. I would really love to see that. 
but he is disqualified from ministry in Christ church. Yeah. Well, at the beginning, you know, storms even set the, you know, sexual sin um, criteria right. at the beginning. But then when Justin Peters brought up Bob Jones and he <laughs> said that Bob Jones was sexually immoral, I think those were the words that he used. Um, Storm said, let's be clear about that. He was mad. I mean, he was obviously mad when he said that. He said, let's be clear about that. That's really slanderous. There was one incident in which Bob Jones manipulated two ladies on the basis of what he contended was a prophetic revelation. He never had sexual relations with him, never. And then he goes on to defend Bob Jones. And it's like, if you can look at the fact that somebody brought women into his office and sexually abused them, okay, I don't even care if he had sex with them. The, the, the whole take your clothes off before the Lord thing, that's enough for me to say, that's sexually immoral. He's an abuser. Yeah. This is a problem. And yeah. for him to then angrily defend it just negated the whole point of him even putting that in at the beginning, you know, and it seems that when they talk about false teachers, they're willing to say, if what you're saying is true, then that person's a false teacher, but they're never willing to say it. And I think it's really their worldview coming out because in as you guys know in the word of faith you can speak things into existence and when they say um you're damning someone to hell you know most people hear that and they think oh well with your words you're saying that they're going to go to hell but that i don't think that's what they mean i think that they are more literally saying that when you are saying that you are damning them to hell and there is a point where if we agree with you then we are participating in damning them to hell and that needs to be taken out altogether because like you already said, we can't damn anybody to hell. I'm not God. I can't, by me saying someone's, even if I said that person's unsaved and they're going to hell, that doesn't change their status of if they're saved or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Know the, the, the whole, that whole thing with Bob Jones, it was almost as if Sam Storms was making a separate category for sexual sin. Mm -hmm. He did what he did in the name of the Lord. Are you not bothered by the fact that this man brought in two women and he abused them and manipulated them to stand to get a prophetic word before the Lord and to strip their clothes? Like that's like you said, that's enough. Yep. Never again will you grace the, the stage, but yet Bethel continues to to laud him as an amazing prophet they've had him at yep. their ministry he's been on stage and taking them into heaven activations and telling them the yep. meat hooks are coming out of them as they're going up to heaven and and yep. all of this crazy stuff he admitted in the past he had mental Im, uh, mental illness um that he was in a psychiatric ward at one point he was seeing demons and talking about killing people um, this is not someone, and, and I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm saying that that this is a prime example of someone who is mentally ill, had a history of mental illness, yeah. and was propped up on a pedestal and presented in such a way when he needed help and he needed yeah. proper biblical discipleship. He did not need a platform. And that's that's one too many. And and it, and it bothered me too when, when Sam Storm said that uh, because I thought, you're making a separate category. Sin is sin. Like, why? Why are we? Why are we um, uh, defending this? <laughs> it was interesting, I, Don. I'll piggyback on that because at the end, uh, Sam did say that Mike Bickle had said he would never be on a, be on his platform ever again. Why? What's the problem? If that if that wasn't a sexual sin, right. why did Mike Bickle disallow him from ministering on his platform ever again? Good if it question. wasn't a big deal, right? It wasn't a big deal. You, that's slanderous, Justin. That's slanderous what you said. Why Why is it slanderous? Did he do it? What, what Was it a, did it happen? And then secondly, they need, they have to have him. They have to have Bob Jones at the center. If he is someone who is disqualified, then the thing falls down like a house of cards. I hop. And the almost the entire movement 
falls down like a house of cards. I don't know, Don, did you have any touch ever in your circles with Bob Jones and his prophecies? Did he? No. Did he, okay. No. So I think the NAR is thoroughly entrenched with his prophecies. IHOP, Bethel, Rick Joyner, Morningstar, mm -hmm. uh, and all the, 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 all the KC prophets, all of them had touch with Bob Jones in some way or another. And if Bob Jones is disqualified or has some failure or something that, that would make him what he is, what we know he is, um, someone who is not a prophet of God, then they have a problem. They literally like the entire thing. I I'm looking into deeper into Bob Jones and the prophetic history of IHOP KC for a upcoming show, actually a review of the, of this, uh, this as well. I'm doing a third, a second and third review and Bob Jones is a whacker doodle cuckoo nut job. He is literally the craziest. I'm sorry. Like yep. I, when you, when you brought this up, Leah, sorry, I got hot under the collar. When, when yep. Sam storm said that Bob Jones is a, wacko uh, uh, he's dead and i don't want to talk about the dead like that but everything i heard him say ev and i'm just i'm not even looking for the crazy stuff like you know i'm not i'm just searching for the prophecies of irma and um, all the things you mentioned and his trips to heaven and hi him actually taking bssm students to heaven yep. I, I mean it's literally the craziest stuff you've ever heard angelic visitations all the time in the book the physics of heaven i have all my heresy pile over here um in the book the physics of heaven he said that god's breath smells like apples i mean there's going to be a second pentecost there is going to be a billion soul harvest and on and on and on a billion souls of youth no less i mean the guy i'm sorry the guy was a crazy nut job and if sam storms can't see that then i can't help him I think I one one other thing to bring up too, and we don't, I can only speculate on this personally. I don't know the answer to this, but the fact that he felt so comfortable and two women came forward, only two. There's more. There's I, 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 I just, I find that very, I, very troubling that he felt comfortable doing it with those two women, but then there, that was isolated. I There's really, obviously I have, more. I have a very hard time believing that that, that that was the case is my argument. Again, that speculation, they would take that as slander, take it at, if they watch, take it as you will. I mean, take it as you will. But I think that that is a valid question to consider um, given in light of what's going on right now with IHOP and the more that keeps coming out um, because another thing in this movement, and it's not exclusive to this movement, but anytime you have spiritual abuse going on, yeah. one of the biggest things that happens is people are afraid to say anything, whether it's spiritual abuse or sexual abuse or whatever's going on. But in this case, with this movement, you have people that are afraid to say anything. And it doesn't even have to be sexual abuse. It can be the mere manipulation from a leader that they're afraid because there's been such indoctrination of don't touch the anointed, don't speak against the leader. You're coming, you're gonna lose your spiritual covering if you say anything against the leader. The demons, Satan's gonna come after you if you if you do this, if you do that. There is such indoctrination with this fear, fear tactics, manipulation, control, intimidation. And some people are beaten into submission spiritually, so to speak, to where they won't say anything. And I think that people need to start saying something, and it can be very hard. Um, and my heart goes out to those. I, I cannot imagine that level of abuse that, the, that these people have suffered at IHOP. Um, but I just find it very, I just find it very skeptical to believe that that's isolated incidents. I, th I, I would suspect that there were more that just never came to light. And you're yeah. right. I, I think the, the I, IHOP KC and the shows that there, that these guys were licentious, they were, um, they were puffed up and they were, here it says in, Col in Colossians 2.18, Paul gives a sort of a list of things, of instructions and things. And right in the middle of chapter two, or toward the end of chapter two, excuse me, he, uh, he gives a kind of a very interesting, like one off, uh, two verse 18, let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions. 
puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. The Casey prophets were all had all sexual problems outside of one, I think. All of them. All of them had some kind of sexual abuse in their background, all the way down. And and it says it. If you go on in detail about visions, you are puffed up without reason by your sensuous mind. If these guys had a vision and they went on and on and on and on and on about him all the time, like I'm, I'm just looking into Bickle because I'm covering him now and I'm not even looking hard. Every single sermon is about, he talks about a vision or a dream or a revelation he had. It's not like he's preaching the Bible. And he says, oh yeah, you know, like one in a million, by the way, God revealed something to me the other, this, about this, that, the other thing. It's every single sentence. Every other sentence is God revealed this, God revealed that, God revealed this. I had this vision, I had this dream. And interesting, it's all it's always this God never spoke, has ever spoken audibly to me before, except for this one time. And it's always the same thing every time. Like, yep. hmm. Uh, so they're puffed up and they're sensuous. So with these guys who are who who focus on as their main source of epistemological truth visions, dreams, and revelations, they are sensuous. And it leads to, unfortunately, sexual impropriety, sexual sin, sexual immorality, and the like, because they're sensuous. That's what Paul yeah. says. Even Paul, the guy who got that awesome revelation, an awesome dream, an awesome trip to heaven, to the third heaven, he did not go on in detail about it, if you notice. Yeah. I said I couldn't speak about it. <laughs> Well, when you look at even Brown, you know, people say, because Brown's highly intelligent, there are some things that he has put out that are decent material that you can learn from, you know, mm -hmm. but then you have to look at the, all the other things that he says. And it, it's really interesting that um, at the beginning of his videos, his intro says that he is the voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. And he's said to be an activist. And then he does things like using these um, tactics that's total social social justice warrior tactics, you know, like let's divert everything and go to Luther and start talking about anti-Semitism and, you know, like, oh, racism, let's just pull the racist card. So it's like they're so focused about earthly things, you know, emotions, experience, like what what is God doing right now in miracles and signs and wonders? And yet when you look at the fact that people are leading other people to hell, they're like, oh, well, we're not going to call that out. You know, let, let's look over here at the sensual things. Let's look at the, the flesh. What, what's feeding the flesh right now? You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things, and I mentioned to you earlier before we start is that I, I said, I have, I have a lot of thoughts <laughs> uh, about, about all of this stuff, but I, a few things is that um, listening to the discussion, I mean, I just thought, why are you defending Gnosticism? Uh, why? Why? I thought that was heretical. I thought, why are we defending Gnosticism and mysticism here? Yeah. And that's what they're doing is that they're defending this stuff that, that that is being pumped out like a Pez dispenser is what I attribute it to, like an analogy. It's just being pumped out constantly by Charisma, Elijah List, Sid Roth, all of this stuff. And then no, <laughs> with all due respect, um, you know, I've heard Michael Brown several times say, well, I wrote in the 1990s about um, right. uh, addressing the charismatic movement. Okay, well, it's 2024. So let's ha let's have a let's have a current discussion about what's going on. And what is really frustrating is again, we have these men that are being and I respect their what work they've done in other areas. I have a really hard time respecting them to be honest with you in this capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because of again, someone who was in this move and you don't have to be in this movement to understand the workings of it. But when you've been in it and you come out of it and you recognize what's going on and then you hear people that are respected um, and they are the well, I don't know. if <laughs> I After listening to that discussion, I don't know if I can put them on the fringe anymore or not, to be quite honest with you, because they're defending it. So that makes my guard go up and go, mm, I don't know about you. And so to hear someone say 
well, I've addressed this in the nineties and I ha I've, I've addressed these errors and, and I've said things and stuff, but then you're, again, you're willfully ignorant. You're willfully ignorant when people show you things and they, well, I don't watch Sid Roth. Well, I don't watch this. Well, I don't watch that. Okay. Well, we're presenting these ear issues to you and these concerns. And the immediate thing is, oh, there's nothing to see here, or you don't know them, or, you know, it's, it's always a diversion tactic. And, and as I told you before, I know we're talking about Martin Luther, and not that that's not relevant and not important, but I believe that he used the Martin Luther as a diversion from this entire mm -hmm. discussion, because now it's all focused right now on Martin Luther. We're not talking about Benny Hinn. We're not talking about Kenneth Copeland. We're not no. talking about Brian Simmons. We're not talking about these people that are bringing horribly heretical, problematic things in, and it's and it's creeping into churches um, and finding its tentacles in places, even in doctrinally sound churches. There are people that believe some of these things and they don't realize how destructive it is. So now we've diverted over here to this other thing that is a valid thing to talk about, um, but let's stay on task. Okay. And, and that's what I would have liked to have seen is, okay, well, that's important, but let's talk about what we were, let's get back on track here. We're dealing, we're in 2024. Let's talk about these people that for decades have led people astray, for decades have taken people's money, have made promises, false, empty promises. They've preached another gospel. They have brought reproach on the name of Christ. Let's talk about that and address it. And that's not, let's not be willfully ignorant and say that we have some credentials, but not address it and not say, this and I and one last point and then I'm gonna stop so that way if Richard wants to say something because I can get really really talkative you mentioned Leah about um, and I think it's a really good point you mentioned about how they're afraid to say that person's damned to hell which again that's not what we're saying um, because of the power of your words it's the same thing as you know um, calling the calling forth those, and I think that there is some some validity to that um, because of the word of faith movement. And I was going to say something else and it escaped me. It may come back to me. So, um, but at any rate, I think that there is some truth to that because they don't want to say those things out loud um, because you can't take them back. One, and once they identify that person, then they know that their own camp's going to come after them. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't and want they don't that. Want and they don't want to be guilty of touching the Lord's anointed, possibly. No. Right. So um, just by the by the way, that's a construct that this movement has created to protect and run cover for people. The touching the Lord's anointed has nothing to do with what they talk about and how they apply that verse. Touching the Lord's anointed in the Old Testament. I have a whole video. I did wrote a whole paper for the Pentecostal Theological Association here in Europe on on the anointing, which is Every Christian, just kind of to sum it up, every single Christian is anointed who has put their faith in Jesus Christ and is sealed in the Holy Spirit. The sealing work of the Holy Spirit is his anointing work. We are all anointed in Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 20, and 1 John 2, 20 and on. There's a lot of uh, that whole passage there in John, 1 John. So I, I have a few thoughts on the what, Sid Roth and the whole thing. He says, Brown says that Sid Roth is his best friend since 40 years. Am I right about that? Something like that. And yeah. he has never seen his show. Okay. Let me just say, he's a terrible friend. <laughs> <laughs> if, you have, if I had a TV show and my best friend had never watched my TV show in 40 years, I would say you're not a good friend. I'm just saying. Secondly, that that's not true. <laughs> He's watched his show. He's his best friend since 40 years. He has watched at least one of his shows, probably more. He's been on one of them, if I'm not mistaken, one, right? Or he's been the host. He, he He's hosted. hosted. Yeah. He's hosted one and been on the as a as a guest. Yeah. yeah. So he's at least watched two because he's so self-indulgent. He's gonna watch the show that he was on, I'm sure. And then he's watched others. There's he's he's just I, I cannot believe he's telling the truth in that that he has not watched one single Sid Roth show in 40 years. That's hard to believe. And you're his best friend. Then secondly, I would say that, uh, that, that, that 
these guys, like I think we said at the beginning, we they, they can't bring themselves to name a false teacher because it might be touching the Lord's anointed. And, and and that's just it's it's too difficult for them, but they would be that fighter on the front lines. Right? Uh Brown pr prides himself on being uh the guy who's trying to root out the LGBTQ movement in the church. Am I mistaken on that? Help me. Is that that's that's no, correct, he, isn't he it? He totally is, yeah. Yeah. So why fight that fight? He's he's cool with fighting that fight and calling people. I would guess he call would call false people false teachers who say that it is okay to be a homosexual Christian. I'm just guessing, but I think he would probably fight against those people. Why fight that fight, but not this one? Is he touching the Lord's anointed? Has he sat down with those people who would say that you could be a homosexual Christian? Has he he heard their heart? Um, they, they just want to share their hearts with you, Dr. Brown. Why don't you sit down with them as well and apply your own measure of what a false teacher would be to those folks as well? Just saying. Um, and then I had another point, but it escapes me as well. So um, we'll, we'll, well, we'll come he, back to it, I'm sure. He outed himself with the whole, he said over and over again, I don't have time to watch Christian television. I don't have time to research these people. But then he was talking about, you know, multiple books that different people had written and the contents of those books. And he, when they brought up Bill Johnson, he was talking about, um, he was talking about the video that Bill Johnson did after his wife died. And he was saying it was, it was such a great and touching video and talking about it. So that's him outing himself. You know, obviously he yeah. watches Christian television. And I was actually screaming the... at that point, like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you watch that video um, yeah. of Bill Johnson after his wife, that was like the most cognitive dissonant, message i've ever heard in my life if you really knew bill johnson's teaching which healing is god's will all the time it's not only god's will all the time healing is part and parcel of the atonement and secondly benny johnson had been taking the communion mm -hmm. in her communion revival for the last years daily more than daily and she believes and taught as well as bill johnson teaches now Lou Engel and all of them, that healing is part and parcel of the communion. Yeah, she even wrote a and book about it. Exactly. Yep. Yep. The power, the uh, power of communion. Power. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's so the thing is so laced with false teaching, it's not even funny that you can oh, yeah. actually plead the blood over people, that you can send curses back to where they came from by taking communion. Can you and imagine? They she got a lot of, I actually looked at that a long time ago and covered that. And she, there's an old document, I think from the 1800s that a, a man named Trumbull wrote, and he mm -hmm. appeals to pagan rituals when talking about the blood. And that's the source that they use. Paganism, animism, yeah. all, spiritism, talk about all that. rolled into one. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So uh, Brown could watch that, that sermon and not have any cognitive dissonance himself. His wife had just passed away from cancer in a place where there is no cancer. According to them, Bethel is a cancer-free zone. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't add up. You have to turn off your brain to re not realize that something is badly and deeply wrong. But I would actually, are we going to get to talking about healing? They talk about healing yep. in this. I think that they don't, that they cannot actually say anything about the healing theology because they actually believe it. They believe yeah. that the atonement includes physical healing for this life. And so they can't say anything about it. They can't say, well, you know, of, you know, of course we're dying and we're going to die and blah, blah, blah. But that totally does not make sense in the theology of healing that they hold to, which is that healing is part of the atoning work of Christ. I think I'm done. I need to stop because I could keep going. <laughs> well, I no, kind of wonder. I kind of wonder too. Sorry, I wonder with his whole argument too. Well, he doesn't have time to listen to the critics. And well, did he read Doug and Holly's books? I mean, he sure has a whole lot to say negative about them, yep. and even wanting to change the terminology and to have them stop using uh, the term "New Apostolic Reformation." You'd they have to rewrite the books. That, exactly. That's so, that's so they, crazy. You'd have you'd have to rewrite Peter Wagner. 
Yeah, yeah that's exactly. gaslighting. That is gaslighting. I'm sorry. Gas. Well, I'm not sorry, but a gaslighting. I mean, <laughs> Richard has books. I have, I have probably quite a, the same books that I have the systematic theology of the new apostolic reformation. I have a whole stack of books. I, I sat under a man who, who was under John Eckhart as his spiritual father. His, he's one of the pioneers of the New Apostolic Reformation. I mean, you read his old work, it's laced through it. He had Peter Wagner write the forewords for his books. What Michael Brown is doing, whether it's intentional or unintentional, is gaslighting. And Doug and Holly did not create that term. Yeah, exactly. So you can't stop using a term that you yeah, didn't create. Exactly. Exactly. He can't read, he can't, he's a, he's a revisionist. He has right. to revise history and go back to the beginnings when Peter Wagner in the, in the late eighties, early nineties started discovering this and named it himself. Right. Wagner discovered the thing and started writing on it. You'd have to rewrite Wagner, like all 40 books that are about, I mean, he wrote 75, somewhere around that many books. A lot of them are repeats in the sense of just getting a kind of recycled material, but I would say 30 to 40 of them are about this movement in some way or another. So you'd have to rewrite 30 to 40 of Wagner's books to redo or not use that term anymore. It's his term. It's the movement's term. They created it. They founded it or discovered it, I would say, because Wagner wasn't a, a, a member of it until uh, the late 90s when he left Fuller. Um, and so it, Brown is all wrong. He, he, he's not done his research. And I'm sorry, like, look, he's got to just pick up a few books and, and go do the research. This is an academic world. Wagner wrote academic articles and 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 pointed to this movement and, and named it and called it what it was and told you what the impartation of the of the apostolic mantle will be and all the all of it. It's everywhere. He just needs to go and have it do, get, get a research assistant to do the work for you. I don't know. Yeah. It just well, doesn't make there's sense. There's no way he doesn't know all of this, you know, teaching at the Wagner Institute yeah. and uh, being friends with all these people. There's no, there is no way he doesn't know what's going on. You know, being best, best friends with Joseph Matera and, being on the ap the apostolic leadership Councils, like yeah. if you read any of that site you go oh that's a new apostol okay yes they use all the same language i get it so you he can't knows. he knows yeah. he's, be he's yeah. being dishonest he's being dishonest but that's part of the thing that i hope more people see through this round table is i i hope that people see the the fact that he says one thing and then he contradicts it a little while later you know, he tells on himself as he speaks. And yeah. um, I think that because it was four hours and there was so much content, it was almost as if Justin Peters and Osman were both like throwing out content, like throwing out like there's this thing and then just sitting back and letting them devour themselves. They were, <laughs> they were just letting them dig themselves into a hole because they were c contradicting themselves the whole time. And you could tell that both Peters and Osman were like, did, did you really just say, did you not hear this thing that I just played for you? Like they said it themselves and now you're going to argue with me about it. You know, oh, on one of those, it was um, Kenneth Copeland says the word, uh, it says that we're gods and what well, he used the word. And then, and then uh, Sam storm says, well, if you mean that he means this, and I'm like, if you mean Justin means this, he, Justin didn't say the thing. He just yep. turned the computer around and showed you the clip. Yeah. He's not trying to make Copeland mean something that he didn't say. And it's not and an Sam, isolated incident either. Mm -mm. It's crazy, man. Like, I'm thinking like, Justin did not make him say something. He said it himself. <laughs> like, let Kenneth talk. He just... He does it. He says it all himself. But Sam and, Storms cannot bring himself to say, oh, yeah, well, that's really bad. But if by that you mean he means, like, what? And j just so everybody's clear that listens to this, that was released um, in, in the way it was because Michael Brown would not agree to editing. He, right, that was the right. only way it would be released. Mm -hmm. to the public is right. uncut. The only thing that's cut is at the end when Justin had to leave. 
and those of us that have seen it because we're part of this project and we know they inserted that the, they inserted the name or the the apology the statements from Mike yes Bickle, the statement mm -hmm. on mike fickle because it was also, filmed months before yeah which is also very sad because yeah. it, it's like they apply their own standard of sexual immorality to themselves and say that right under their noses like literally sam storms he said in the thing he mike bickle was his best friend in this world and I actually really, I, I my heart went out to him. If that's the case, Sam Storms has been deeply, deeply deceived. I mean, th can you imagine your best friend in this world? And and then and then secondly, the standard that he applies to false teachers and false teaching was his best friend. Like his best friend, what is that standard mm -hmm. of sexual immorality? And so it's really deeply sad because these guys are, are ob it's obvious after the fact that they have no discernment, none whatsoever, except for maybe the LGBTQ issue. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, when you're watching the roundtable discussion, at one point, Brown admits that the fake leg lengthening was a total shtick. Like he's like, yeah, I've known about that for decades now. And he he says that but then he says but i know todd and he wouldn't do that like he, he says yeah I, I know that's a shtick but that's not what todd's doing and um he was shown the evidence you know like it's not like he can say i i didn't see it because he he had just watched it right. but it seems like the unequal weight and measures by brown and storms to say you can't call someone a false teacher because you don't know their heart and yet at the same time, they say, well, they're not a false teacher because we know their heart, you know? So what do you do with that argument? It's it's so double talk. Like, how? what do you do with that? Um, I, I'll say this, and I'm not, it's not a proud thing for me to say, but I, I actually did that to people when I was in this movement. Um, and there was no deception that was at work on my part. I think there's some psychosomatic things that are going on there. Um, but this is this is something I was taught by the leader I was under. You set someone a chair, um, and I'll get back to your question in a second as far as what this is, but uh, mm. I was taught this very same tactic. And again, I think there's power of suggestion. I think there's psychosomatic. There's adrenaline in your body. I mean, there's so many different things. That's not a miracle. I mean, someone's foot growing out an inch or their leg growing out an inch is not a miracle. And, and we could see from the evidence that there is manipulation going on. Um, but we have to be diligent in addressing these things and taking people back to Scripture and not being afraid to say, this is nonsense. This is not glorifying Christ. Um, I've watched a lot of Todd White videos, and even though he seems sincere and like somebody you just want to spend time, like jovial at times, and if you didn't take in the false teaching, you think he probably has a really good attitude about stuff. Might be fun to be around just in general. But the fact of the matter is um, we have to look at False healings and things are going on in this movement, false teachings. That's fruit. We have to be willing to look at that. And we can't be afraid to say, there's a problem here. And if you know, you know, if, if, a, if someone is saying that they know it's a problem, then those people need to all the more be pressed on this and say, okay, well, if it's a problem, then why aren't you address it? Like, why are you just okay with it? And, and not addressing the issue because ultimately what's coming down to is that people are being deceived and they're being drawn away to these people. They're not being drawn away to Christ. They're not being drawn to Christ. It's elevating these people and showing, oh, you need to trust in this person in order to get healed um, and to see what you need in your life. So I think that we, we've got to be diligent about going back to Scripture and to be willing to call a spade a spade and to address these things and not just whitewash them and say, well, you know, I, that's been around for a long time. But, you know, I've been around I've been around this person and their heart's really good and they, they're so sincere and they love the Lord and love people. OK, well, 
but is what they're doing really glorifying God or is it glorifying them? Are they really fulfilling? What, are they really ministering the gospel? Because that has to be the fun, the fundamental thing that we go back to. What gospel is being ministered? And if the focus is on miracles, signs, and wonders, and the gospel is a tag on, mm -hmm. which is what it is in this movement, or they'll say the full gospel is including miracle signs and wonders. And if you don't do that, you're not preaching the gospel, which that's not the gospel. And first Corinthians 15 doesn't address that at all about miracle signs and wonders. Paul makes it clear of what the gospel is. It's based on the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. Mm -hmm. So we can't, we can't shy away from addressing these things. They have to be addressed head on. And when people are um, putting themselves out there as prominent leaders, then we need to press them. On this matter because they're being looked at as respected people and if they're just saying eh, it's not a big deal just you know we we know them they're okay then you're covering for wolves mm -hmm. you're not protecting the flock you're covering for wolves yeah yeah it's really dangerous yeah i would piggyback on that idea and actually ask the question so you asked the original question was what's the argument against that and i would say that signs and wonders, Dr. Brown, Sam Storms, if I were if I were in that had been in that discussion, I would have say that Jesus never confirms that miracles are a fruit of the gospel. Ever. As a matter of fact, he contradicts it. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 7 15 and following, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Okay? The fruit is following. Here it comes, the fruit. Um, can can uh, you gather, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, are figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Here's where the fruits come in. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's the fruit. On that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your leg-lengthening name. <laughs> and then he will declare, I depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Let's say, let's just say, for argument's sake, that Todd White can lengthen legs, and it actually is a sign, a miracle, or a wonder, whatever you want to call it. Here, right in the red, <laughs> the red ink, the red letter. We did mighty works in your name. And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. So you people will be able to, false prophets, false apostles, etc., will be able to perform miracles if to even deceive the elect, as it says in Matthew 24. But those fruits are not fruits even of a christian it says here much less a revival or this or that or the other thing whatever it may be so let's say todd white can lengthen the leg and it does heal the person it does it's no evidence of his even his regeneration sorry you will be all these false prophets will be able to do in God's wisdom, in God's sovereign plan, I do not know how and why. I will ask him that question when we get there. Lord, what, what were you thinking? What were you doing here? Uh, letting people have power in your name. Um, but apparently there will be some who do and have done miracles in Christ's name and will be workers of lawlessness. So their own measure of miracles say power evangelism, um, the signs and wonders gospel as it goes. You know that, And basically, many, many people in the movement, including Bill Johnson, would say that you're preaching an incomplete gospel when there are no miracles accompanying. And that is just not the case. It cannot be because Christ has said it. People will be able to perform miracles and not be regenerate even. So my argument to the leg lengthening shtick would be, hey, 
um, yeah, sure. Maybe he can lengthen legs, but he cannot, it, it's not a proof that he's regenerate even much less doing um, the works of Christ or fruit, uh, having fruit of ministry. Yeah. What does he say about the Lord? That's a big question. What does he say about the gospel? Who, who's Jesus? You know, uh, talk about fruit. Let's look at the fruit of his ministry. When he goes and tells um, witches that they are uh, loved by God, lo God loves you just the way you are. No, no, he doesn't. You know, God, God can love sinners, but it's not, <laughs> you can't just say Jesus loves you. It's fine. You know, he, he hates, he hates sinners. And I know that sounds like a, a duplicitous statement, but it's God. He can both love and hate at the same time. But you can't just go tell people Jesus loves you just the way you are and not call them to repentance and not call them to the cross and tell them what did Jesus do because he loves us? You know, what? how do you even love somebody if you are not going to share the actual gospel with them? Well, according to Todd White, at bank, uh, God, God loved you so much it bankrupted heaven. There was something in you that God saw that you were that were, that was valuable enough for Him to bankrupt heaven. Um, that's just not biblical at all. So, no, the only there's one false that teaching have in us is because of Jesus. Very much sounds like a wrathless gospel. Yeah. Yep. And Christ took all the all the wrath of God the Father upon Himself for us, and you don't hear. Uh, my husband and I talked about this quite some time after coming out of all this. We we said we cannot remember a single time within this that we heard the actual gospel according. I mean, you'd hear bits and pieces of it, but you would not hear about the wrath of God and that judgment was upon you because with the wrath of God because of your sin and your, your rebellion against God. I mean, those the terms would be used as far as sin and repentance, but it was very sparse and... Um, it was more of decisional repentance, you know, every head bowed, every eye closed, raise your hand, answer an altar call. And not that God can't save people in that, but people need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the, the true gospel and why they need Christ. It's interesting uh, that you bring that up, a, a wrathless gospel. Uh, I, it just reminds me of what Richard Niebuhr said of uh, Christian liberalism. In the early 1900s, he said, a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. Mm. That is the liberal gospel. And it sounds kind of like Todd White's gospel. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know what you're saved from, there's no turning away from your, I mean, it, if you don't know your need for a savior, then you cannot then turn to your savior to save you. You know, there, there is no salvation apart from understanding that there is wrath and it is coming for you because of your own sins. You know, like you're not great. Like the whole world tells you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what are the dangers of I think this is what we were just talking about. What are the dangers of prominent teachers not being willing to call out false teachings or teachers among the flock? Well, I think that one of the biggest dangers is, is that we have um, sheep. We have, first of all, <laughs> there's a couple of different things. We have sheep that are, that are going to potentially be devoured. Um, they're going to have the wolves come in and they're not going to understand proper biblical discernment. Um, and then you're also, um, th they're not being fed properly. So um, I know one of the things that was a struggle in coming out of this and finding a solid church was uh, I would, I remember leaving churches, we would try to find something and I would be in tears at the end thinking, I'm, I feel like I'm starving. Like I, I just want to be fed the word. I don't want all this hype. I don't want all the lights and the emotionalism and and working myself up into a frenzy, I, I want to understand the word better before I went in for the corporate gathering. I think when you allow for these false teachings to come in, you are um, denying those who are truly God's sheep, you're denying them the sustenance of the word. And so then they're getting all this junk and cotton candy and circus. It's a circus show. I mean, it's a... It's like a three ring circus sometimes in the charismatic movement. 
I mean, between all the manifestations that take place and and then the teachings and and work, you're on a spiritual hamster wheel, working yourself up into a frenzy, trying to bind the devil and pray and walk the floor and pray in tongues and um, go to the next conference so you can receive an impartation from somebody and, um, you know, try to prophesy and get activated and activate others. And I mean, it you run the huge risk of the sheep that are true sheep. They're, they're going to starve spiritually and they're not getting fed. And then you're going to have goats mixed in with the sheep that think that everything's okay because of all the manifestations that are going on and what's, and it does damage. It, it ultimately does damage to the church because we're not, the, the, the leaders are not protecting the sheep. And that is the, the role of pastors. They are to guard the flock. They are to t- keep out the wolves and keep out the false teaching. We've got to have solid pastors, men that are willing to stand and to protect the flock and to say, this is wrong because what scripture says. And we are going to hold God's word to a high standard as believers, and we're going to obey it. And um, I, I would like to see more of that happen um, with these these men that are willing to be bold enough to say, these are false teachers. We need to, if they want to address their movement, then address it. I personally, I mean, I was taught um, <laughs> a, a, um, a fragmented uh, history. And mm-hmm. uh, I had to read Robert Slaredon's God's Generals as one of the books that I had. And um, there's several of them, but the blue one is the first one. And we read about the God's Generals. And so you're, you're taught a warped, uh, charismatic history. It's full of holes. And then when you come out of it and you start looking, if you take time to look into it, you realize that the pieces you're missing help you to see this is a mess. This movement is a mess. It's full of con artists. It's full of people who are liars and murderers, um, of swindlers. It's not, and uh, granted, nobody's, everybody's fallible and I get that, but it's painted in a very different light when you're in it than when you're out of it. And and I, I would just love to see these men that if, if they're saying they're in the charismatic movement, then be willing to do the hard work and to say, these are false teachers, these are false prophets, and go back to scripture and, and not still hold on to some of these extra biblical things um, and making compromise with that. Yeah, I mean, think about people in, any other camp if they hear somebody that okay for instance i'll just say me if i heard that somebody that i listen to is a false teacher i go and look at what that person said i i go to the source and i go are they a false teacher let's let's look into it because if they are i'm not going to be promoting them i'm, I'm not going to be listening to them you know i'll be praying for them but how amazing would it be if uh, Michael Brown or Sam Storms were willing to look into it and say, this person is teaching falsely. We ought not to listen to them. I, I know that they're my friend. I know that they're in our movement. I love them. I'm praying for them. But we need to close them out of our circle and say, until you are orthodox, then we cannot allow you in fellowship with us. And you need to shut down your ministry. You know, that would be so huge. That that would be a great thing for the body. Well, now, Leah, I, I would have even accepted just the statement, something to the effect of, okay, so he shows a Kenneth Copeland clip or he show, says something about uh, Benny Hinn and this, the other thing. He would, I would just have appreciated him saying, you know, I don't know about that. I really will take some time now that you've brought it to my attention. Thank you for bringing it to my attention and look into it. And try to make an assessment because I don't know. I'm not informed enough. You yep. guys are well informed. Could you help me even become more informed? I would really take your your uh, appreciate your help in becoming well informed, and then I will come to some conclusion. But but thank you for at least that. But there was nothing like that. There was no admission of after just evidence and video after video and. I mean, I, you see Justin just getting tired of like trying to just swip his computer around, you know, and show him stuff. But 
they just can't come to the to that to that point. They can't come to the point of saying, you know what, I will look into it. I don't. I'm not informed enough. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. I will take some measures. So, uh, to to your question and to your point, though, the passage in Titus on the qualifications for elders gives us in chapter one, Titus one. Verse nine, it says, he, meaning a pastor who was someone who has the qualification to be a pastor, t- teacher, elder, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, meaning this thing, not to prophecies, visions, dreams, revelations, but hold fast to this thing, all 66 books, and uh, uh, hold fast to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. They're not capable of that. And so thus, both those men, in my opinion, are not qualified to be pastors, teachers, or elders. They are not capable of rebuking people who contradict sound doctrine. And sound doctrine, it says it here, is this word, this word of God, and teach it and and if you so from your teaching it says basically it says you are able to give instruction in sound doctrine and if you start there then you're capable of rebuking those who contradict it if you don't start there and give instruction in sound doctrine meaning preach and teach this word he told Timothy be ready preach the word in season and out of season right that's what our goal is and task is as pastors, teachers, elders, and they aren't capable of doing it. That doesn't seem like they're even possible to, to, to guard and rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine. And so that, that makes them disqualified and not capable. The other thing I wanted to, to, to bring up was, um, that they are able funny enough in the, like the hour and 46 minute mark, I think I'm trying to see my notes here. They're able to say that Kat Kerr is crazy. Did y'all notice that? Yes. Yeah. Like, actually, they said, would y'all agree Kat Kerr is crazy? And and Brown goes, mm, yeah, he kind of gives this look. <laughs> he didn't say, like, yes, but he was like, give the nod. Why exactly is Kat Kerr crazy? Is it the pink hair? <laughs> is it the trips to heaven? Is it the prophecies? Is it that she can control nature? Is it that she uh, just sounds weird? All those things that Kat Kerr does, people in this movement have done. Kenneth Copeland says he can control nature. Perhaps. Mike Bickle has dreams and visions on top of dreams and visions. His dreams and visions have dreams and visions. It's it, There's nothing, there's no difference. Why is Kat Kerr crazy? Why the judgment on her to that extreme? There's no... There's no reason. And so they can't even found or, or, or give a, give a, give objective evidence for Kat Kerr being crazy, but she does all the things that these people in this movement do every single one of them. She just sounds maybe a little crazier. I don't know. Why did they say that? Uh, that's, that's the thoughts I have so far. But it makes I... you wonder how outlandish the visions have to be for them to finally go. Yeah, no, not that one. You know what? It, is it that this the North Pole in heaven, the you know Santa having? I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. Oh, Christmas Town, yes, yeah, Christmas Town, mm-hmm. Christmas Town, yeah, in Jello Land. Mm-hmm. Well, look, look, uh, what's her name? Um, uh, Heidi Baker says there is a body parts yes. room in heaven. Yeah. What, what's the difference? Yeah, is there's even another man that talks story? about Skittles in heaven. Skittles. Yeah. Skittles and that we have to taste the goodness of God. We need to taste God's sweetness because he taste saw Skittles rainbow. in heaven. That's yeah. on Sid Roth. So what standard, what, what standard is used for vetting I on measure. Sid Roth that Kat Kerr is off limits? I have seen crazy stuff on Sid Roth. And I, I even told you, I said, I can name at least half a dozen people that I know personally that have been on Sid Roth that I either know personally or I am my own leader that was on Sid Roth or where I was affiliated with those people. I can name at least six people that I know that were on Sid Roth. And so, so, so actually Sam Storm says that he says like, we, we should test prophecies by what standard do you test? Right. They don't even, they, they, they have no standard to test from that. Um, and so they, they're so, like I said before, they have to accept the KC prophets 
if they don't have the KC profits, then the whole thing crumbles down like a like a house of cards. So they have to have they they they, they believe so heavily and so deeply in prophetic utterances that it has like the 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 standard they're dealing with unequal weights the prophetic standard have deeply outweighed scripture in their movement and and, and um, unfortunately Wayne Grudem and and those uh, folks even Sam Storms have given room and made room that the prophetic utterances in this movement have gotten deeply out of control because essentially the gift that they're attesting to is not the same gift in scripture. No. It's not the same. Well, and Sam Storm said that you can empirically uh, test the Bob Jones prophecies. And then when he shows, he's shown the evidence, he's like, oh no, I did my own research. And it's like, well, which research did you do? Because it, I can do the research and I can show you that they're not real or, or that what he said was not accurate or how about the fact that these things keep changing you know you, you hear somebody talk about it and then you hear them talk about it again and it's different it's like well which one do i listen to do i listen to the first one or the second one you know and and he and actually sam storms did say we should not say thus saith the lord I don't know what point at, at what point he said that, but he said that's that's deeply controlling and manipulative. We should not say thus saith the Lord. Why not? Yep. If 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 God is saying giving me a prophetic impression, why not? And then secondly, the whole IHOP foundation is based on thus saith the Lord. Go look at it. They're prophetic. I, I just I'm just clipping a video together now, and I'm taking all the the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said, and just putting them back to back. It's like 40 of them. They have four videos that are all 12 minutes long, 12 to 15 minutes long. And I'm just taking out the, thus saith the Lord sections. And literally it's totally laced. Every video has 10 or so, 10 or 12, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord said, the Lord told me, the Lord showed me this, that, and the other thing that that's thus saith the Lord. And there's easily 40 different times where all sorts of people say, thus saith the Lord in a, in, in a number of some, some, some formulation of that. Right. Well, later and, Sam Storm said, um, uh, God told me and they called him out on it. And he, he was like, Oh, hold on. And he tried to change his language. Le and well, the like, Lord led me or something like that. Yeah. But if God's talking to you, it, I mean, I, I am under the impression from reading scripture that if God's talking to me, I'm going to know he's talking to me. It's not going to sound like me. It's not going to be questionable. It, it's just going to, yep, God said this. So why wouldn't you say God said, you know, well, well what's you're, the you're, problem with that? You're also taught in this movement. And again, I, as someone who taught uh, from Chris Vallotton's prophetic training in the church I was part of, um, you're taught the, this in this movement. You don't say, thus saith the Lord, um, prophecy is not, it can be fallible. You're just practicing here in the, which says no biblical text anywhere, but you're practicing here in the voice of God. You don't want to say, thus saith the Lord. You know, you need to say, I feel like God is saying this to me. Again, we don't see this language in scripture. Um, you don't prophesy dates, uh, mates and children. <laughs> okay. Well, are you trying to tell God what to do? I mean, if this is truly prophecy, why are you trying to control it? Because the prophets in Scripture didn't do that. And Agabus even spoke as an Old Testament prophet did, saying, thus says the Holy Spirit. Um, so they, they try, honestly, I mean, again, in retrospect, I think that that language is used as a safeguard in order to avoid accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, because you want to claim, and it's not the same gift, if you want to claim it's a gift of prophecy, that God is authoritative every time he has spoken. He never speaks unauthoritatively. And for me to decide, oh, and God, and a, pro, a true prophetic word will confirm what has already been confirmed to you in your heart. Really? Is that is that how prophecy works in Then scripture? why do we need it? Why do we need it exactly. if it's already been confirmed to yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> so then, then that puts me in a position of being God, essentially, because then I get to determine when God is speaking and when he's not speaking and it undermines the sufficiency of scripture. And I think it's very freeing to come to the fact of, I don't need any additional words. God has said all that he has said needed to say for me to know him, 
to know his mm-hmm. attributes, to know what he loves, what he hates, how I'm supposed to be as a, as a wife, as a mother, as a disciple of Christ. If I need anything further than that, then his word is not sufficient. Yep. And then what he has given us uh, ultimately to know is not sufficient. And then that really is dangerous because then you start creating God in your own imagination. And I think that's another thing that's happened in this movement is that God has cre- been created in their own imagination and uh, basically giving these pretenses for the prophetic movement um, and saying this, and it ultimately um, sets someone up to avoid accountability. Oh, I can call myself a prophet, but prophets are fallible today. So then you avoid accountability, but you're really, again, bringing reproach on the name of Christ in, in your conduct, in what you're doing. And it is not the same gift as in Scripture just as like we can look at tongues and we can look at these other things. It's not the same gift. What they're talking about is not the same gift that's found in scripture. And they need to, and they need to address that. Yeah. And, but we're told that that's our baseline to look at. We're, we're to look at scripture to know how we are to live and you know, what these things are going to look like, but then they're, they don't look like that in this movement, you know? Why don't they just call it encouragement? Like, that's what it is. Like, Hey, I, I think you're a, I think you're a great worship leader. I think, I think you have a future in worship leading. Maybe you should keep doing that instead of like the Lord showed me or the Lord told me or the, wh- why does everything have to be prophecy? Yep. And then notice too, about the spiritual gifts. I know this is not, this is like total tangent, but uh, <laughs> notice with the spiritual gifts too, there's prophetic conferences. There's healing conferences. There's a focus on the tongues. There's a focus on all those, but you never hear, well, we're going to have a mercy conference. Well, we're going to have an administration conference. Well, we're going to have a faith, like focusing on the the other gifts. So if they want to get upset for people calling these things out, it's because that's what is focused on in this movement. They don't focus on the other things that aren't flashy. They focus on the things that are, you're going to activate, which that came from Bishop Bill Hammond. I mean, if you look at some of his stuff, he was the one that was started calling that about activating the gifts and things, which sounds very new age, honestly. But I mean, they focus on those things because that's where the power and the, um, the pull of people comes in. You know, you don't hear them hearing about it. Let's teach you about how you can, um, uh, serve others. We're going to have a serving conference so you can learn how to have enhance your gift of serving. You don't hear any of that. It's all of this other stuff. And then it's misconstrued and, and scripture is abused and taken out of context. I, I want to jump on that activation idea. The, the gifts of the Holy spirit are activated at the time you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when he seals you in his Holy spirit, they're activated. They're ready there to be used by his supernatural power. You don't have to have an apostle activate anything. Okay, sorry. And secondly, I want to I want (laughs) to I want to brag on my wife on this particular issue. We uh, experienced uh, at a conference we were just recently at some people who were obviously part of the apostolic and and prophetic stream. And they were saying, trying to convince us of the the effectiveness and the power of the fivefold ministry. Uh, it was a uh, it fell on deaf ears because my wife immediately they said we have we have training for apostles and prophets. We have these great training programs for apostles and prophets, and they had com- tried to convince us of the fivefold ministry. There's five of them, not just two. And so my wife asked, "Oh, so you have? Oh, what am I doing there? Did that did that happen? Yep, Balloons came across my." <laughs> Someone activated my balloons. I don't know what that was about. That's weird. That's funny. <laughs> uh, so my wife, they have uh, a program for training the pe- people in the prophetic and the apostolic. And then my wife said, oh, interesting. So you have five-fold ministry at, at your church, training in five-fold ministry. Do you have programs for the other three? <laughs> and she said, no. Funny, huh? Fascinating. How that works. Uh-huh. Huh. Surprising how they only have two fold in the five fold. Yeah. Yeah. So. so I thought it was funny when Don mentioned um, before we were, when we were talking before the uh, video, she was talking about 
Sid Roth having the team of people to vet who comes on the show. And I I know when I heard that, I was cracking up. I was just like, that that's ridiculous. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that well, they is, do vet. Yeah. No, they, they do vet people. They vet the people. They want those people on there. Yep. They don't want people. If you haven't been to heaven, they don't want you on their show. If you haven't had someone, um, you know, send Skittles down through the jazz, uh, through the saxophone that you're playing, that isn't enough. They need a good one of those, you know, one of those dramatizations. They need something really, really cool, like Skittles coming out of the, you know, melt your face jazz. You know, they need that. They need Jesus playing melt your face jazz, or it's just not a good dramatization. They want they, those they people on there. Yeah, they need somebody who will uh, play the violin and everybody can age backwards. That's a good, that'll be a good one. It, it was one. That, it that was, was one. actually, okay. so, sorry. A girl, said, a girl I, said that she could play her violin and people would age backwards. See, that's the problem. It's so ridiculous. I actually think that that's one that you made up, but it's actually a real show. <laughs> I mean, amazing. See, it's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. It seems like, one point that Storms was fighting against, like a lot of the time, was the idea that only the negative was being shown. And he was asking why the the positive side of the charismatic church wasn't being shown. Um, it was it was only the negative. So how do we encourage the positive side of the charismatic church and at the same time differentiate and reject the dangerous ideas that are taking over? Well, I, I think to start with, um, a lot of times there's this anecdotal appeal. Well, I know um, someone who was in a far off land that saw someone raised from the dead. And then uh, there's no proof of that. I mean, we're having to go by what they're saying and trust that they're being truthful. And then they probably heard it secondhand. It would be, I think we would, we would all easily say, we believe that God heals and that he does miracles today because he's God. He does them according to his will, not according to our will or our command or our declarations or anything like that. It's according to his sovereign will. And we would all rejoice if we could see proof that these things are taking place. And, and I think that one of the things that would help this is um, I think dialogue is important to be willing to engage in dialogue with these things and not on either side shut someone down and not want to listen. But if they're going to make claims, then they need to pro provide the verification for that. And that's not to say that we don't have faith to believe that God can do those things. But I, I would argue the point of saying, I want God to be glorified. And I don't think a lie or a false sign or um, saying that God did something when he didn't and you're making it up, I, that does not glorify God. Um, and so I think them providing the proof to that, I think that seeing more biblical teaching <laughs> and yep. as opposed to the, uh, the focus on all these manifestations and all of these things taking place that are not a biblical approach um, would be most helpful to see, but really having um, meaningful conversations. And that's one of the things I try to do with people that are still in this um, because the tendency in this movement, again, not exclusive, but the tendency in this movement is to shut the, the critics down, and that's that's unhelpful. Um, we, we need to be able to have these discussions, but we've got to do it with an open Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, and be patient, be kind, gentle. Um, I, I don't forget how, from where I had fallen, <laughs> um, and I want to remember that and be gracious. Um, charitable, but not compromising. Um, I think we can be charitable in listening to people without compromising the truth or believing uh, ridiculous things that really don't glorify God. And so if they're going to make these claims, then they need to be okay with someone saying, well, can you provide the medical documentation for this? We would really like to see this uh, instead of it being anecdotal, because ultimately we want to glorify God with the truth, mm -hmm. not with a fabrication or an embellished story. Yeah, absolutely. Are you charismatic, Richard? Um, if you mean, uh, by charismatic, um, 
believing in the continued continuation of the sign gifts, then let's say yes with a seatbelt. I'm a seatbelt a continuationist. I'm not a classic uh, cessationist, but let me explain that. <laughs> um, I don't believe in this movement's emphasis on prophecy and uh, babbling tongues. That is not uh, the, the New Testament gift and it is not being practiced in a New Testament way. So it has to be, if, if we're just talking about tongues, um, the tongues gift must be practiced with no more than two or three speaking at a time. There must be a translator, uh, not in, not in chaos, but in order. And if you don't have a translator, you must be silent and speak between yourself and God. And what else? Oh, it has to be a known different language that you do not know how to speak. I don't know how to speak Russian. And if I all of a sudden had a supernatural ability to speak Russian, that is the gift of tongues or another language, right? It's not babbling gobbledygook. It's not Shaba. It's not Shambhala. It's not Romboyo. I've, I've heard uh, a, a famous teacher here in Germany. Uh, Royo Romboyo. That's his go-to tongue. That's not the gift of tongues. Um, that's not the biblical gift of tongues. And then prophecy, the emphasis on prophecy that that it, it's it's called reading. In this movement, they're talking about the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation, and a lot of charism charismatics would basically practice prophecy as a cold reading. And that's not the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. And so in that sense, I mean, if if it came down to it, I really am a cessationist in that because no one's practicing it that I see in the mainstream movement. And those guys have it right. Justin and Jim have it right. These are the mainstream folks. They're the most visible. The guys who are actually doing the tongues properly and in order in this movement, you never hear from them. I've seen it done before where I actually heard a tongue. I thought, wow, that is a different language. I'm pretty sure. I don't think that's, that's not gibberish. And then there was a translation and the translation was like, wow. Um, now I think it was actually scripture. So like, that's funny. Like, wait a minute. Uh, why do we need that? Why didn't we just read it? The page so there is a thing and there is a sense in which there is no new revelation. Do we believe in the revelatory gifts? And so all that uh, long story short, I am, I have a hard time. The reason I probably am not a cessationist all the way is because I have a hard time condemning my brothers and sisters in Christ who are actually probably doing this correctly. They're actually doing what the new Testament describes. They have one person speaking and then a translator is there. Not everybody speaking at one time. I've seen this done in order and in, and in, and in, you know, a nice way that the Bible does describe, the New Testament does describe. But by and large, when they say, speak in tongues from the stage, that is unbiblical, and that mm -hmm. is a terrible, terrible, chaotic practice, which Paul condemns. So the movement does not really, can. I don't, I've not seen it practiced um, by and large, and we can discuss that, but the reason that probably the reason I, I grew up, I, I grew up in a, a let's say a more open, uh, denominationally open. I went to a, a Bible college that had lots of denominations, and we were actually able to to get together and get along really well in this. And I saw I, it's hard for me to condemn or say that my brothers and sisters who are in the charismatic movement in the AOG, which condemns the majority of these practices in the new apostolic reformation especially apostles and prophets that it's hard for me to say well th th those those charismatics who would practice it well or biblically um to not be doing correct something correct so that's hard for me that's that's probably the reason i i can't go all the way but people say oh you're just a cessationist <laughs> bro 
okay, stop with all that. Like literally, like that's the, that's the that's the brain stopper, the 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 conversation stopper. You're just a cessationist, and that's the trump card that they want to play, and then the the discussion's over. To them, or they think the discussion's over. You're just a cessationist. No, but you can't show me any church, hardly anywhere in the world, that's practicing it as the New Testament describes. Yeah. So, long story short, well, <laughs> I think that I think. Sorry. Go ahead. I I think Richard, you make a good point because, um, one thing that I know I I make a point to acknowledge is that not all charismatics are New Apostolic Reformation. Right. Um, I've had charismatics come on and they'll get upset with what I'm saying, yeah. but. I'll tell them, you know, I'm willing to have a conversation with you. And I, and that's why I said, I think that it, we need to be willing to have these conversations as far as to back to your question, Leah, we need to be willing to have conversations with people. Even if we don't agree, um, we need to be willing on the side and, and all of us to a certain point, I think are cessationists is what Richard was saying too, that, that people want to just throw that term out. And then what happens is from the charismatic perspective, cessationists are demonized. And they're, mm -hmm. then they're told, well, you have a religious spirit. You don't, you don't even believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I think I could actually even technically say I'm still a continuationist because I, um, even though I, the more I study, the more I'm like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a cessationist now with a, with a lot of this stuff with the apostolic gifts because I'm, I'm understanding more what it means. I'm but coming I, slowly to that 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 conclusion a, too. Probably, I would argue, and I've heard another. This is not my original. Um, I can't lay claim to this, but I heard a debate between Wayne Grudem and Ian. Oh, I can't remember his last name. Um, oh, I'm forgetting his name. Um, but he, he, Ian Hamilton, that's who it was. They were, it was like 10 or 12 years ago. They had this debate, Wayne Grudem and Ian Hamilton. And Ian Hamilton made this point. He said, well, I'm a cessationist as far as the apostolic gifts, but I'm a continuationist because I believe the Holy Spirit is still working today. And I thought that's a really good art. That's a really good way to put it because when people hear cessationism, they immediately think you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You don't believe that He's doing anything. Oh no, I. The Holy Spirit is very much. If you could have seen me five years ago, yeah. He's very much at work in my life. He is yeah. sanctifying me day by day. He is helping me to to grow in my in my faith in Christ and to trust Him in situations. He's helping me to understand, illuminating the Word to me. He's um. Yeah. He's convicting me of sin when that happens. He's drawing to me to repentance day by day. He is very much at work. Um, and just because someone says, I don't believe that what you're saying in the charismatic movement is that is not taking place today, that does not mean that I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is working. So I think that we have to get back to this place of dialogue. And, the, and we have adopted things in the world where we just cancel people as far as not wanting to engage the conversation. And I get it. There's some conversations that are going to be extremely unfruitful. I've had those happen my, myself. And, you know, you have to pick your battles. But we have to be willing to have conversations. And we ultimately have to remind ourselves, my conduct is to glorify Christ. So I want to leave a discussion, whether cessationist or continuationist or charismatic or someone that's entrenched in the NAR, I want to leave a discussion, be willing to have this discussion with them to understand I'm not going to know everything, but take things back to scripture, be gentle, be patient, be kind, and conduct myself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Not, it's not about me winning an argument. It's about what the truth is based on scripture. And I think if we would be willing to have those dialogues instead of being keyboard warriors, because we've all been guilty of that, being keyboard warriors online, um, I think that we could get somewhere. Um, and that's why I liked seeing this roundtable. I do want to say that in a positive light. It was good to see these four men get together and have this discussion. I don't like yep. some of the stuff that came out, um, and I extremely disagree with some of the things that Storms and Brown stood for. But I'm, I, I, at the same time, I'm thankful they were willing to have this discussion because it was long overdue. Um, and I and I think it is a model for us to see this needs to happen more yep. so that we can go back to what Scripture says. Yep. Well, I asked I that think... question for a reason, though. I, I asked that because, you know, to to showcase the good side of the charismatic movement. Right. I, I can't say for myself, I can't say 
I am this, that, or the other, because I don't like being fit into any of the categories at this point. I, I'm too reformed for charismatics and I'm too charismatic for reform. So, <laughs> you know, I, I just am what I am. <clears throat> I try and be biblical, <laughs> you know, yeah. but the well, whole thing it- is if I'm sticking up for, if I'm promoting people who are charismatic, if I'm promoting their, um, their content, they're just not as charismatic as you want them to be. You know, right. we are showing the good side of the charismatic movement. <clears throat> We're just showing the biblical side also. Yeah, I would I would uh, amend my answer a little bit uh, to to say that uh, the it seems like to me the majority of the charismatic movement puts emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> <laughs> And the, and if their emphasis is not on this book and it's 66 uh, smaller books written by God-inspired, Holy Spirit-led, indwelt men, then you're putting your emphasis on the wrong thing. If you're putting your emphasis on signs, visions, wonders, fake miracles, whatever, even, even tongues, then that is your emphasis source for epistemological truth coming from God, then that is your revelatory. You believe that that is revelation. Mm -hmm. Sola propheta, sola tongues, uh, you know, not sola scriptura. Sola scriptura is what makes us evangelical. And this movement, especially the NAR, and then some charismatics as well, because they, they make room for the NAR within their, within their camp have, traded these novel things like tongues even like prophecies dreams visions trips to heaven anybody on sid roth's show those are those things do not line up with scripture and they are new avenues for new revelations which god has not inspired and so i'm that kind of charismatic (laughs) The charismatic that says, if you're not preaching the word on a consistent basis in your own church services, church services, when you meet together, are for fellowship, for the preaching of the word, for communion, for baptism, for singing hymns, songs, and spiritual songs. And if you're not doing those things, if if your pastor is not preaching the word on a consistent basis, literally opening it up, and going through it verse by verse and explaining to you its meaning, then you're not in the right place. Yep. So there was the the idea that, I mean, it's it's hugely prominent right now, and it's being pushed by many people in the charismatic circles today. And that's the idea that it's always God's will to heal. Brown both agreed that God can use sickness for his glory and immediately argued in his story uh, about getting COVID that in the midst of terrible sickness, he doesn't see how it could glorify God because of how devastating and debilitating it is. I know that the three of us can absolutely attest to God being glorified through sickness, through ailments, through all kinds of, you know, not fun, horrible life issues. Um, So how do we address this to a world that doesn't want to believe that God's will is not always our comfort? Either one of you can start. Don, why don't you go for it? I I think that one of the ways we can address it is, um, is to, you know, like we've been talking about going back to scripture to see um, the fact that in God's sovereignty, he has allowed things and they're ultimately for his glory. Um, and testifying even in our own lives after we've gone back to the word of helping in a conversation to, to show that God, um, that God has been gracious and kind, uh, in our own trials and not dismissing them as what can happen in this movement as attacks of the enemy um, or that we're just not, don't have enough faith, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, 
I think we, we have to help people understand the sovereignty of God and part of God's sovereignty is that he does allow sickness. And we don't understand that. I don't understand that. Uh, you know, and I've talked before um, about, you know, even in my own life, my husband was diagnosed with MS in 2021. And there were some very difficult things that we've faced in the past few years because of that. And I can't imagine what it would have been like if I would have been in this movement and that happened. I think it would have destroyed me. Mm-hmm. I think it would have absolutely destroyed me because of how I, my mindset and the belief system I had of decreeing and declaring things away and commanding things and binding Satan and all the things that I was practiced and what I taught. And in, in that sickness, um, I think another thing that we have to, that it would be helpful to do too in dealing with this is to help people understand that God is glorified in the midst of that and that he works, Romans 8 talks about he works all things for the good of those for, who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Yep. And I, I've said this before to other people, but um, what a lot of times what we deem as good um, is not what, what the Lord allows <laughs> In our lives so someone could to look at us and say well i don't think ms is good so that's not god's best but i can attest to you that through that it was it was him getting sick that helped me to know how to biblically pray Mm. um to realize that i was an error and and um i can tell you that the lord used that to help me understand that i was that it was okay to acknowledge being weak and to need his strength because mm-hmm. of what his, his word says. I could tell you that in that it helped me to learn how to be a, a better wife and to not begrudgingly serve him when he needed it. Um, to, to, I mean, there's so many different facets and I think that that's one of the things that we, we have to be willing to acknowledge is that when we face trials in our lives, it, illness, if, whatever it is that's going on that we we want to talk about um how it, it's it really is designed to draw us closer to god um and to be conformed to his image and um in his sovereignty for him to be glorified and to break this stigma we, we need to break the stigma too that everything we deem good is what god wants for us and that means health wealth prosperity I must walk in physical healing and otherwise I'm not, I don't have God's best in my life. So we've got to tear down some of these false mindsets. And and ultimately it's, it's probably, this is the theme of our discussion is going back to scripture Mm -hmm. and, and testifying of what God has done in our life in the midst of these trials, because if, if we'll have a better look at that and instead of wishing them away or praying them away, but if they don't go away, then say, God, then use this to sanctify me. You know, if there's something in me that needs to die, that I'm depending on myself, that I don't, that something is, is an error, then use this for your glory and that for a testimony of your goodness. And so when I look at that in my, in our own family, I, I see God's grace. I see answered prayer. Um, it may not have been the answers I wanted, but I, I see that. And so I think it, it really goes back to having a good, a better biblical understanding of who God is and that he's not my wish granter. Yep. Um, he's God. And there's things that, he's, that he allows and, the, and they're beyond my control. And then I'm reminded of who's sovereign. And I'm not sovereign. Yep. Um, and I'm reminded of my need for him daily. And so I think that that's, that's where we need to get back to. Absolutely. I know for myself, um, dealing with, you know, I've had COVID twice. And I have uh, chronic illness, chronic fatigue, chronic, you know, inflammation breathing issues, all kinds of stuff. So when he started talking about um, having COVID, he said there, there, um, he said, getting past the theology, when I got hit with COVID, it messed with an issue that I had in my heart that I didn't know about. And the whole point was theology. Like the whole point of the discussion is you don't get past theology. We're talking about how God can be glorified through the sickness. That you have, you have to not get past theology. And, um, you know, for myself, I've watched God just give me grace and mercy and the amazing things that he's done in my family, bringing my family closer together, you know, making me just like 
realize just how much of a need for him that I have in in every single breath, in every heartbeat. You know, like there there's a point where for me, I needed to be reminded, like, your next breath comes from me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I needed that to be a reminder. And um, and I've watched him use me being sick in other people's lives and them being able to look at me and say, you know, I, I've seen all these wonder th- wonderful things God's done for you through it. Not, not because of it, but despite it, you know, and sometimes because of it. So it's, it's just one of those things that it's like, if you say it's always God's will to heal, then you are negating the idea that God can have things for your life that are not necessarily feeling good. And throughout scripture, we see time and time again, God give people sickness, God people, God allowing people to have sickness or troubles or poverty or whatever, and him doing wonderful things through it. And that's when we can look at how amazing he is and the sovereignty of God and sit and marvel at him instead of being caught up in ourselves and, um, and thinking that we have to have everything good all the time, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just awed by y'all's testimony and your grace and handling what you're handling Don with your husband's MS and Leah with your chronic illnesses Y'all just handle it with such grace, and I'd I'd really like to uh, offer uh, a few passages of scripture to help us deepen this discussion. This is really great. In Second uh, Corinthians twelve, Paul has his vision, and he said he saw things that were too in- inexpressible. He could not express them. So these guys come back from heaven and on Sid Ross show, and they express everything they saw there. Notice, but Paul says, "I could not express them," and he says in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. He didn't go on Sid Ross show and and uh, talk about his revelations. He would he would not have made he would not have made the cut. <laughs> mm-hmm. He he uh, said, "I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content in weaknesses, in insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong." And then. The same, I, th- I believe, I think a lot of commentators agree, but I, th- I think the same uh, illness that he faced in uh, Galatians 4, verse 13, is the same illness, I think. And it says, you know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. So if it is God's will to always heal, then Paul preached the gospel outside of God's will to the Galatians. Now, isn't that something? Mm-hmm. So uh, we've also had our fair share of things. My daughter uh, was born to us with Down syndrome, and imme- almost immediately in her 10th month of life, she developed a seizure disorder, which... I don't need to get in the details, was a very deep and dark valley of the shadow of death. And I'm sure you ladies could probably attest to this, but I have never learned anything of faith-building significance in the green pastures. I have only learned of the reliance and the goodness and the faithfulness of God and his sovereignty and his control and his shepherding care in the valley of the shadow of death where his rod and his staff protect me. And so I know that this, that the idea of the healing gospel that is proclaimed in this movement says that the, the cross has uprooted the roots of poverty, health, 
our disease, disability, and the like. And that comes from, just to give us a kind of a background, I think that comes from a guy named A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance denomination and mission, which he proposed a fourfold gospel. He called it a fourfold gospel. And one of the four folds, one of the four pillars of his gospel was Christ is healer. And he believed that according to Isaiah 53, like we hear it all the time, that by his stripes we are healed, that that meant that Christ died for in his atoning work on the cross, purchased for us our physical health in this life. And that just cannot be substantiated by any New Testament texts. Now, I, we can talk about Isaiah 53, but the context is pretty clear. His chast chastisement, um, sins, iniquity, and the whole lot. That's the whole passage of Isaiah 53. That's talking about our sin and our lostness. So it is a hill I will die on. It has become a life. For me, like, um, sorry, my daughter was born with Down syndrome. It was a surprise to us. We did not have any prenatal testing. And so abortion has become a life issue for me. And this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel has become a life issue for me because almost immediately when our daughter was born, people asked us and has been a con constant common theme, don't you have enough faith that God will heal her? Or some iteration of that statement. The most recent iteration, and I've cut it off at the head, I've not allowed it to touch our family since about four, four or five years when we left our last church. The last thing that someone said to me, said to our family, was uh, Satan was the source of my daughter's Down syndrome. Said that to my wife. And that's why I believe it is a doctrine of demons. This idea that healing is bound up in the atoning work of Christ is a doctrine of demons because you will never experience that in reality. No one, no one ever will not ever have a cold in this life, for instance. And we all die of something. Faithful, Jesus-loving Christians die of illness, disease, and, and in the end, death is disease. It's your body dying and not working anymore. So the promise, Christ did die and was given to us and gifted to us in our as part of our salvation, a new incorruptible body on that day when we are raised from the dead. But in this life, you will have trouble, Jesus said. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And if you out there, if someone's watching today and you are struggling physically, hang on. Hang on, believer. Christ is near. His rod and his staff, they're comforting you. Hang on to the ledge of his great grace with your feeble fingers. And I promise you, they've been feeble in my life before, but he will sustain you. Richard made such a, a good point, um, and it, it angers me to hear that someone would say that to you all about your daughter. Um, and I think ultimately, when you look at this movement, um, Satan is sovereign. They yeah. deny the sovereignty of God in this movement. They would not, again, they would not, uh, they would not, um, admit that, but over and over again, um, even in the deliverance movement, whole other topic for another time. But and it shows itself because you have to keep yes. binding Satan. Yes. You always have to yeah. keep binding him. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So he's always the one that's doing something, but we have to ultimately go back to God is sovereign and he is sovereign over Satan. Satan can only do what God permits him to do. Look at Job. So Yes. Look at this yeah, passage. This, exactly. this passage of the thorn in the flesh. Exactly. All those passages show exactly that Satan is, is bound by the work of God. God is sovereign over him, and he only is allowed to do what God allows. Yeah, exactly. So if we can get people that are in this movement to understand that, um, I think that is a huge hurdle to get past um, because your mindset has been so indoctrinated with that for so long. I've got to bind Satan. I've got to, I've got to defeat Satan. I've got to defeat these devils, these demons, but God is sovereign. 
And when you begin to understand that, then you can rest in God. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials and difficulties. Um, I love what Richard shared there because it's so encouraging. Um, and I'm actually reading a book right now about Psalm 23. And he mm. talked about, you know, that recognize it's the shepherd that leads you into the valley of the shadow of death. He hasn't left you. He leads you. So he has led you into that valley. And there's a reason you may not understand that, but he's sovereign. And that's something that people in this movement and coming out of it must grasp um, in order to, it'll bring, it brings such peace in the midst of, of difficulty to know that God is sovereign. If just let me piggyback on that, Don, if I had believed that Satan was in charge or doing something to my daughter during her, her nearly year and a half of, of deeply troubling epileptic seizures in the middle of the night, these all happen from three to 4 a.m. in the morning. If I had believed that Satan was in charge or doing something to my daughter, I would have despaired. But God, the creator of the universe, who loves me and has sent Jesus on my behalf, is standing next to me in that storm. And he is holding my hand, his rod and his staff, and I can cry out to him in the deepest, deepest trauma and despair and trouble. But if Satan had been in control of that and had been doing something to my daughter that my, my sovereign God had not allowed or or had been in control of, I would have despaired. Yep. So this is a this is a troubling, troubling doctrine, and it is a doctrine that leads people to despair because what happens is eventually is that person says, "Well, I'm not getting better. I, um, something's wrong with me. I'm taking this communion every day for the last year, and I'm not healed." like Benny Johnson says in her book, then either you're, something's wrong with you or something's wrong with God. And nothing's wrong with God. But then people deconstruct because they're, they're deconstructing, and there's lots of evidence out there that people are deconstructing. The new trend in deconstructionism is that people are deconstructing from this movement and not from the true evangelical faith. And actually, let me just give you a, a real quick idea. Um, Sam Storms uh, was part of the Evangelical Theological Society. In the 2017, he was a president of the ETS. And early in the 2000s, there was a debate called that, that was going around the ETS called Open Theism. And basically quickly said, very, very, very shortly, that God doesn't know your future decisions. Yeah. Or he's not sovereign over them, and he does, and so that thus you can make a bad decision or an evil decision, and, and so that was handily rejected by, funny enough, all the charismatics in in the ETS by Wayne Grudem, Sam Storms, John Piper, and a few others. Bruce Ware was heading up this this uh, pushback against open theism, right, and so people were condemned or let's say disfellowshipped out of the ETS. And I actually wonder where Sam Storm stood in that debate. Did he, he can't condemn anybody in his own camp. It's impossible. He can't do it. He can't bring himself to do it in this round table. But I wonder actually what happened in the open theism debate. Did he actually vote those gentlemen out of the ETS at the time? Just a question I have. I wonder if he'll answer if he can publicly talk about that. But I say all that to say that this is open theism, that Satan is in control and God is not. He doesn't know your future decisions, and thus uh, he can. And actually, um, in the book that you mentioned on the the New Apostolic Reformation by Harold Eberly, the theology, uh, the the systematic theology yep. he wrote, he says that open theism is New Apostolic Reformation theology. Yes. Yeah, and, and Wagner was, even wrote about it in Dominion, exactly. that, that Destiny Image republished in 2022. Yeah. He openly and talked about open theism. Yeah, That was condemned. Wayne Grudem gave a, a – a, there's a video of Wayne Grudem out there uh, giving a, a, a presentation saying talking about this story, and he said that in principle the ETS said that open theism does not line up with biblical inerrancy and is not evangelical. So – uh, these ideas, especially that Satan can cause 
uh, sickness, illness, and that God is not sovereign. He doesn't know your future decisions. Those people who are in the NAR are deconstructing from that type of theology, not from true evangelicalism. Does that make sense? I don't know. I didn't. Yes, get in the- that's a good. That's a good point because I don't so, think a lot of people really think about that. I, well, I, mean, I really think I have a big theory. I think, and I have to do some research. I, I'd love someone to be able to do some kind of research into this. I think that people who are deconstructing are deconstructing from. You think about Hillsong, the the guy from Hillsong that deconstructed the Gunger. Uh, he do, he deconstructed. He was in a care in an NAR mo- in a church. Uh, you know, Jesse, our, our good friend, Jesse, who's now been uh, interviewed by uh, American gospel. He was in the NAR. These guys all deconstructed from the NAR. I really believe that's happening. I, I don't think people are deconstructing from true evangelicalism, the true biblical Orthodox historical faith. I think they're deconstructing from another non-evangelical faith. It's because true evangelicalism is not mainstream. That's yeah. the fringe. Yep. <clears throat> Unfortunately. When, um, huh? Un- unfortunately, yes, you're right, I think. Yeah. When talking about all of that, you look at Kenneth Copeland. He's got a, a pacemaker. You look at um, one person after another. The glasses, you know, heart issues. There's There's all these different issues. Their theology doesn't even work for them. Yet, uh, when talking about all of this, they, they were specifically talking about healings amongst their circles. And Brown said, those of us that are Pentecostal charismatics, we more aggressively seek God for healing and see much more healing in the process. It's so liberating and it's so beautiful. It brings so much life and even brings salvation in many cases. I would wish that it could be acknowledged that there's good coming through our more devoted seeking of God to heal. And I'm like, I heard him say that. And it's like, how much holier than thou can you be? You know, he he's just sitting there saying, well, we, we seek God more. And that's not true. We just seek God in truth. We, we don't want to seek all of these lies. That's not seeking God. And to seek God's not seeking myself. It's Sorry. not going to be what? I I know I I know I jumped in last time, Don. But can I jump in here? I'm really chomping at the yes, bit. Yes, you can. Absolutely, go for this it. This bothers this bothers the heck out of me. Why would God heal people more because you're just focused on that? Right. It's like prophecy as well. Uh, because you're focused, because you're in this movement, God reacts to you more or, or, or there's more healing because you focus on healing. That doesn't make any sense. God does not, God does not bow to our whims and demands right now. We can beg him and plead with him in, in humble reverence. Lord, would you please heal our family member? Please heal this and that and the other thing. But this movement demands and, 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 puts God subservient to our whims and needs and desires and wants by making decrees and declarations, healing decrees and declarations. And that you're putting God to the test. And it just doesn't make any sense, even logically that you would see more healings because you're in this movement or not. Right. If God's going to heal, he's going to heal. Right. Right. He's not going to, he's not going to say yes, because, uh, you know, because that's an open theistic God that puts God under us and he's not sovereign anymore. And so that kind of stuff bothers the heck out of me, man. Like we see it more, it is holier than now, Leah, first of all, but secondly, to me, it's like, wait a minute, uh, just because you're, you're you you focus on something it, it's actually sort of like a psychological twist because i'm more positive that's the power of positive thinking positive stuff happens to me right um or because i you know like for instance let's just say basketball basketball is my my trick i've spent tons and tons of time playing basketball i become better at it because i'm more emphasized on it right 
it doesn't, it, you know, I became good at it by doing it. Right. It's not like it, it's not like I, uh, try to figure out how to make this, this argument close. <laughs> um, I, I, I emphasize it and thus I'm better at it. Right. But that's just me doing it mentally, doing the work. Right. I've put myself into it and now basketball is my world. It's the same thing. If because you think about healing all the time, it's psychosomatic in some way. God's not doing that stuff. It's just it's because you're putting an emphasis on it that it happens, yeah. that it happens. Air quotes. Well, Does that makes sense. Shows, yeah, and it shows the the emphasis of we're doing it more, therefore it's happening more and putting that emphasis on themselves. Look at what we're doing, you know? That it's no longer look at what God's doing because it's so much of we are seeking it more. We're doing the things to make it so that God will work more in our lives. And then it's a hamster wheel, too, because you have to you're running in this hamster wheel. Dawn, I don't know if this was probably your experience. You're look. Oh, healing, 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 healing. We're always talking about healing. And so you have to pursue that thing and contend for that healing. And you're just running in that thing, man. And you're consistent. And it, and it, actually, there's numbers. There's lots of evidence. Clifton, I forget the guy's first name, but there's lots of evidence that there's nobody in these movements who are actually disabled and and with long term uh, uh, illness, chronic illnesses, because they're just consistently talking about healing and healing, and they get sick of it. They want to throw up in the corner, and they leave. And they do. And so people who are there just have, oh, I get a migraine once in a while. And, you know, and and they're they're psychosomatic. They're li- literally made up because people who are really ill have gone, have left long ago because it's so sickening to them. Does that make sense? And so yeah. this this hamster hamster wheel, you're just consistently talking about it. And so the pressure is immense. And I've been in them. So people who say, Richard, you have never been into a church like that. Yes, I have. We had to leave because that person, one of the leaders, one of the elders of the church said to my wife that your daughter's sickness is from Satan. I wasn't having it anymore. Whatever it was, I wasn't having it. And I had to cut that thing off at the head and and nip that thing in the bud. I'm trying to use all the Southernisms I can. We, I had to do some bud nip and I had to leave, man, because it was so, so sickening. Every single week, someone had to have a healing. I wonder, are there that many sick people in this church? Like, literally, there's so many sick people, but they're not because they've all left a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the dangers of not speaking out against these teachers. You know, it's it's part of the danger of allowing people to think that that's who God is and that's how he works. Because when that's not how he works, they, they go, okay, well, either it's me or it's God. You know, when I was, when I was, um, listening to Todd White and I was somewhat caught up in the charis- hyper charismatic NAR movement, I wanted all of the things and I, I wasn't willing to manufacture anything. And I I've had, um, illness and I've had all kinds of things. It's like, okay, well, this isn't going away. Do I think God can do it? Absolutely. He could just, boom, take it away anytime he wants to, you know, Uh, like, yes. Do I want it gone? Do I think he can? Mm -hmm. It's all there, but it's not gone. So obviously there's an issue. I know it's not God. I know I have the faith, but then I had to start going to the point of, okay, if this is what they're teaching and you are supposed to be this glow in the dark Christian who can heal everybody and speak in tongues and do all prophesy all the time. And that's not what I am. Am I even saved? And then it was, thankfully, I had enough of a foundation from my upbringing to know what the real gospel was. And I had to go back to, I know the word is the word, and this is my foundation. I need to see what it says. What is the gospel? And as soon as you sit in that, you can go, oh, okay, I have freedom in this because it's not up to me. You know, the, God's sovereign. He's the one who can heal me if he so pleases. You know, he's the one that's going to work in my life, regardless if I'm sick. He's the one that is um, good and right and true no matter what. So the, the dangers is if you don't have that foundation, 
you you don't go back to the word and say this is my foundation because that's not what they teach in that movement they teach you know prophecy and healings that that's what you're to look to but if you don't have the word to go back to if you don't have the foundation of the gospel of course you're going to deconstruct of course you're going to throw out what you think christianity yeah. is you know yeah. it, it's really dangerous i mean people are dying yeah. because they're throwing out medication or they're not going to doctors or they're not getting chemo there there are people that are literally dying because they have the faith and god's saying i'm not healing you you know and that's 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 what our experience was at the same time our daughter had this seizure disorder at 10 months old and god healed her he did we didn't throw out any medication. We went we went through every single rigmarole that we could go through medically to try to get this thing, uh, you know, out of her life. And, and the same thing with my brother. My brother, at 17 years old, got into a life threatening car accident, broke his uh, odontoid vertebrae, the the last vertebrae, the vertebrae that Christopher Reeves broke. If y'all remember Christopher Reeves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and he was a quadriplegic because of it. My brother got into an accident, broke that vertebrae in his, in his spine and didn't, was not paralyzed mm. and broke tons of other bones in his body, broke his orbital, uh, socket here in his eye. Um, I mean, all sorts of things. He had bleeding on the brain. I would not have recognized him in the ICU had my mom not been standing at, the, at the, his bedside. It was really crazy, but God healed him. 20, 30 surgeries later, whatever it was, he had a tons of surgeries, but God healed him. He is well and whole. He can't move his neck all the way. I, I want to mess with him. I tap on this shoulder and go around the other side, you know, <laughs> but um, God healed him. He didn't use the means we would have expected. And we would have hoped he didn't have to have all these surgeries that he had, but God used all those doctors and physicians and the whole thing, the whole process to make him well and whole. And he's, that's, boy, that's almost 40 years ago now, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it, God uses those things and he does heal, certainly. But as a rule, it can be really, really dangerous. And it was dangerous for us. I mean, like I said, we've had that, that, uh, that prosperity, uh, healing gospel cloud hanging over us consistently. And since the last five years, when I stopped it and nipped it in the bud, we haven't had that, uh, said to us and lately, thank God, um, because it's, it's pastorally abusive too. Yep. Really pastorally abusive. Well, I know we're going long, so I will jump to the last question and that is, does God require spiritual leaders to be faithful to his word and able to discern between light and darkness, exposing the false and calling to repentance? Yes. We'll throw it at, we'll <laughs> throw it at you, Richard. That's an easy. That's the easiest question you've asked all day. Yes. Oh. I mean, you know, it's, it stands in the qualifications of pastor, teacher, elder. Um, but this movement doesn't believe in pastor, teachers, elder. They believe in the twofold gifting apostles and prophets, and those guys will go to bat to defend their buddies who are apostles and prophets. Uh, Shayon, namely, who names all his buddies as apostles in the book, Modern Day Apostles, and they'll go to bat for these guys because, so so I guess, you know, if you have an apostle and prophet, you, you probably don't have to have discernment as a gifting because that's the role of a pastor elder teacher yeah so yes they should be able to do that but they're incapable it seems like and it's a really sad sad uh, scenario and i would say actually unfortunately sam storms has proven he's not a qualified pastor anymore and should step aside from his pastoral ministry because he can't protect the flock of god from mike bickle who is a wolf unquestionably a wolf in sheep's clothing and has devoured the flock of God with his false visions, false prophecies, false revelations, and his sexual abuse of women for the last 40 years. So Sam Storms is not qualified because he was deceived by this man. And, and Michael Brown as well runs cover for all his apostolic buddies, uh, 
all the, from from Bill Johnson to Shay on to Shay on called him an apostle on his show. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, yes, <laughs> answer is yes. <laughs> Don, yeah, I throw it to you. I yield the floor, Don. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, they absolutely should, and I and I think that the examples that we see uh, within this movement. And again, I know that this type of abuse is not exclusive to this movement, but the discussion is surrounded, is surrounding this movement. They need to be addressed. They have to be for the sake of the sheep, for the well-being of the sheep, um, and that, um, and also for the, for the well-being of the, the leaders. Um, We've got, we have to have godly leaders that are willing to call these things out. Um, and, and ultimately so that God is glorified in this. And to turn a blind eye to it, um, I, I, have a, I have a real problem with listening to um, people who are supposed to be esteemed and they're, they're seemingly turning a blind eye to this. And when the, it, when the evidence is presented to them, mm-hmm. then excuses are made or, well, you don't know that person. Or uh, I would have to sit down and see, did this produce fruit? Did this do this? Did this do that? Why can't we just go back to what God's word says about this as far as what the standard is for a godly leader in the church and and stick with that? And so, um, yes, I, I think it's it's vitally important that that we have leaders that are willing to do that. I have uh, one one thought uh, as well. What would it take for these guys? My My question to them would be, what would it take, honestly, for them to name someone a false teacher? How far would be too far? What kind of anything, teaching, anything, would it take for them to name someone as a false teacher? I don't think they could do it because by that standard, they couldn't name any historical heresy as a false teaching because they'd have to sit down with that person, like Sam Storm says, and says, oh, well, I have to sit down with them and see their heart and see if they'd um, if they hold to that actually, or whatever, they couldn't name Arianism as a heresy, which it was, it was a heresy because that was a historical heresy. Arius is not alive anymore. Pelagianism. They couldn't name Pelagianism uh, a heresy because Pelagius is dead. Eutychus. They couldn't name Eutychianism a heresy. Those are all those historical heresies are his her- heresies, but they couldn't even bring themselves to name those people as her- name those things as heresies. Because by their own standard, they have to sit down with them and talk with them. But you can't talk with those guys. They're all dead. So that's my first question. What would it take? What would it take for them to name something false teaching? And, and then sadly, you know, um, where where is this going actually in the end? Where, where does this all end up? It ends up with people in the movement who are, who are not protected and who don't have um, the biblical discernment to to actually name it for themselves either because these guys on the front lines so to speak are not would not dare touch the lord's anointed and that's a sad sad situation and and so um i i I just you know good i'm glad these guys sat down and really thanked them for sitting down and had taken four hours of their time to do it but it fell it fell flat it fell quite short in my opinion um sadly I don't think they have the capability, the ability to name someone as a false teacher that's that should be marked and avoided. If there's if we can't name someone, it's a total use uh, exercise in futility. It, it, what, what, why the even the moniker false teacher? If you can't actually say this person here should be avoided, then what are we doing? Why even have this discussion? The point of being able to do that is to say, this person teaches this and this and this and this, and they should be avoided. So that's my take on it. I yield. Yeah, when <laughs> um, when they brought up uh, Benny Hinn and the Nine God Godhead, um, Storms totally defended him. He, Well, it, that was like 30 years ago. Didn't he repent for that? Well, no, he didn't repent for that. He, he pretended like it was a joke and you know people took him seriously but it was just a joke but he said um he said that he would seriously doubt that he was a born-again man if he sat down with him and pressed him on it and he said yes 
that he believed that. So at that point, what is your view of the importance of our view of God? Like, wh where do you draw the line if you can't say that if you are changing who God is fundamentally and saying that he is now this nine God Godhead, if you can't say you're not saved, like you, you're outside of the Christian circle, then you have no leg to stand on to say that you have any kind of criteria for what being a Christian is. Like your Sam opinion Storms, doesn't matter. Sorry, more. Sam Storms is naive. If he thinks he's going to sit down with Benny Hinn and he will say, oh, yeah, you know, I taught the nine person Trinity and I stand by that. He is naive. He's going to yeah. slither his way out of it because that's what he's done for 40 years. He has repented countless times for his prosperity gospel, his seed theology, and then he always comes back to it like a dog to vomit, the scriptures say. So Sam Storrs is naive if he thinks he's going to sit down with one of these guys and they're not going to slither their way out of their false teaching. And he'll walk away saying, oh, okay, well, I guess everybody's wrong. All the critics are wrong. No, you take their public record, their public teaching, their public books, and you hold them to those, those things. Yep. There is a thing called material heresy in the, in, in, in the, uh, when we study heresy, historical heresies, there's a thing called material heresy where people have actually written heresy and you hold them to it on their written materials. And we, th these guys have materials out the wazoo and they're act. And so even when they talked about Martin Luther and bought him up, he's been 500 years dead. All those things that he said were terrible and awful, but he's 500 years dead. These guys are actually living, doing this stuff consistently to the body of Christ, to the body of Christ, I would say in air quotes, because <laughs> I think these people are, who are following these people are deceived and being deceived. So Sam Storms proved he is deceived. He was deceived by Mike Bickle and is being deceived. So deceivers that Paul talks about it. He says deceivers are deceiving and being deceived themselves. So yeah, he's he's naive to think that these guys would sit down with him and say, oh yeah, I really do. I did preach that nine-person trinity uh, and I hold to it. He's naive. Sorry. So I know that I said that was the last question, but um, <laughs> so what did you think about when uh, Brown said that Kenneth Copeland's followers didn't actually know what he was talking about when he was saying that we are gods? I mean, he, he made them sound like they were just completely dumb, so they wouldn't even know what he was talking about. And it made me wonder does Michael Brown think that his followers are so dumb that they don't know what he's saying when he's spouting off the NAR theology and fitting it in, in between, you know, somewhat legitimate, good doctrine. Well, I've talked to some of these people that follow Kenneth Copeland and they know exactly what he means. Mm -hmm. They believe it. They believe that they're little gods and they do not like the fact of someone addressing the error in this they believe what he teaches because what he teaches is unbiblical he does not exposit the scriptures appropriately to to help people understand what that means he has never once to my knowledge clarified that he does not mean that we are little gods he has made it abundantly clear for years that we are just like god that we that adam was uh that uh, what was it that he said a long time ago that Adam was God manifested in the flesh? Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't think that you can, that you can just misunderstand. That. Th that's pretty clear. Yep. So uh, again, I go back to this whole thing with Michael Brown and Sam storms, for example, it's willful ignorance. So please don't, don't claim that you are a pillar in this movement and that you stand for solid biblical teaching, and then the evidence is presented to you for these men and why it is so heretical and so problematic of the teachings, and then say, well, yeah, I just don't know them, or I've never heard of them, or I don't watch their... Well, it's presented to you right now. So yeah. you're, you're operating a willful ignorance of this, and, and, and because of that, we shouldn't listen to you because you don't look like you have any concern whatsoever 
about people being devoured in this movement and they're being led astray and essentially after another Christ. These men are preaching another gospel. Yep. Anybody who would claim that we are little gods is preaching another gospel. Period. I mean, I don't under I mean, I'm not even a scholar and and that seems pretty clear to me when I read scripture. Nowhere in scripture am I going to claim that I am a god. Because God knows no other god according to Isaiah 43. He knows no other gods but him. So he what what Kenneth Copeland teaches is luciferian. He is a mouthpiece for Satan, and I have no problem in saying that. He is a mouthpiece for Satan. And he needs to hear the gospel. He needs to repent while he still has breath in his body. Yep. That man is leading many people astray, and he has been fed by greed. Yeah. 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 And if these men can't call that out, then we need some other leaders that the charismatic movement needs other leaders that will. Step yep. aside. Yep, exactly. Step aside and let someone else do it. You know, it's it's these guys that what they're doing, they're doing what the you know, the the little kids on the playground used to do. La 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 la, you know, just like sticking their e fingers in their ears. I'm not listening, I'm not listening, you know, when presented with evidence. They know it all. They're not being honest. They're not being honest. Yep. Well, I really appreciate you guys and I appreciate this discussion. I think that it was very fruitful and I'm hoping that it is absolutely edifying to the body because um, it's just really important that more people are able to come together and talk about the issues um, and be direct with them because too often people just want to be nice and um, just skirt around things and not deal with them. So I really appreciate both of y'all's time and um, I'm going to end it here because I know <laughs> we're going long, but thank you guys for coming on. Welcome. Take care. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Leah. Good to see you, Richard. Second Peter two verses one through three, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Second Peter 2 verses 10 through 22. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For, speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. 
the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Thank you for listening to the Take Me to Eternity podcast. If you have questions or would like to contact me, you can email me at takemetoeternity at yahoo.com. You can find me on Facebook and YouTube under Take Me to Eternity. My podcast is on most podcasting platforms. You can also find my blog at www.takemetoeternity.com. Thank you for joining me today. It has been a pleasure. Until next time, know truth, love truth, share truth, because Jesus is truth. Be blessed.